when you see fans on the internet talking about comic book history, like how much do we actually know? <laughs> what would you say? Well, of course, and of course, we're talking about things that happened 30, 40 years ago. People's memories change. Again, we're doing my autobiography. I've, I call my autobiography confabulation because there's a thing that human beings do when they're recounting events, they confabulate. They actually change things around to make a better story of it. And, and I became aware when I was doing this that, yeah, that there's the way I thought things happened in the past. Actually, now I look at the publication dates and I look at the convention dates, that couldn't quite have happened, but I could have sworn it did. So I think you there is people recollecting things wrongly. There is people joining dots and not actually coming up with the right pattern. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Comics Cube. I am today with the time-twisting, future-shocking, watchmaking, Washington-going, socializing, ring-slinging, kings-making, original comics laureate, Dave Gibbons, how are you? That's some introduction. Wow. Can you tell uh, I prepared you, for that? You give me something to live up to now. Just the last one, Comics Laureate. What I know it's was impressive. That about? Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's quite 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 awesome. My first question that I ask everyone on the show is yeah. why do you love comic books? Why do I love comics? Now, I have got a very succinct and to the point answer to that, but um, I won't try and find it on my computer now. When I was lucky enough to be awarded the Will Eisner Hall of Fame Award at San Diego Comic-Con a few years back, um, I actually unearthed a little essay that, that I'd written some time before about why I love comics. And I think um, if, if people want to hear me say it, I know you can look at that presentation speech online. But it's basically, you know, I was fascinated by comics when I was a kid. From the first time I saw comics, I was kind of attracted to them. And I sort of thought it might just be an infatuation. Like for most people, it's just an infatuation. They kind of, you know, most people when they're kids read comics. And then when they get to 10 or 11 or 12, they kind of stop reading them and get, get on with, with other stuff. But because I still love them beyond that point, I realized it wasn't an infatuation. It was indeed... Um, a kind of love affair and it it has become a lifelong love affair I mean even now I'm still enthusing about comics even now I get excited when I look at comic art so I think it is kind of true love and I'm by nature I'm a very loyal person and I think I've never neglected my first true love um, and I think to be more specific about it you know if you love to tell stories which is what i is basically my motivation. It's never been really drawing for the sake of drawing. It's been drawing well enough to get somebody to be lost in a story while they look at it. So um, it's that particular aspect of it which I which I love so much. Um, and I think that's that's a thing that you can communicate with people very economically with comics you know like if you wanted to tell stories in the movies you got to have movie cameras lights actors huge budget with comics it's literally a piece of paper and a pencil or or a pen you know it costs you pennies and you can take people to worlds of wonder so even when i was a kid i thought wow i can do these things i've just got to make myself draw well enough that other people would would want to look at it so i think that's what brought me into it and then there are other times in my life where maybe when I went to when I went from my small primary school to my big uh, you, you know much more scary school comics were something to kind of cling on to um, and to get lost in and they were a completely absorbing hobby and some friends of mine used to collect comics as well and we cycle all over the countryside trying to find the shops that had the American comics in that we loved. So it kind of socially, it was quite an involving thing. And then when I came to do it pr professionally, kind of even before the internet started, there, were, there was a kind of clique of British comic creators that all knew each other, would meet up once a month 
and so it became a, a kind of a social support system as, as as well so i can't imagine doing anything other than comics and i must say i've been very lucky that you know i have spent most of my life doing something that i love and i sort of love it to this day is is that the sort of answer you were looking for of course absolutely <laughs> Do you remember the first comic that you fell in love with? Um, I do. I mean, when I was a little, little kid, we used to have what we call nursery comics, you know, with sort of, uh, sort of talking bears or, you know, elephants and, and that kind of stuff. And I can, I've got vague memories of looking at those when I was a kid and having my parents read the words out to me. And I think that had an effect on my education because... You know, I could look at the pictures and I wanted to know what the words said so that I could read them myself. So, I, I mean, I learned to read really very young. But I suppose in terms that people watching this could re relate to, the very first comic that really excited me was a Superman comic, um, which was an Australian reprint of an American action comics, which starred Superman. And the cover image was Superman in a cave with a big chest of gold treasure and um, him emptying more treasure into it, I believe. And standing in the mouth of the cave was Lois Lane saying something like, I cannot believe it, Superman is a super miser. And it was, <laughs> it was this weird thing. And I thought, hey, this is, this is really cool. He's this really good looking, powerful guy. He's got loads of money and the women love him. So maybe that was some kind of inspiration to me. And I can, remember I mean this is a tale I've, I've told often I can remember when I actually got that comic and I was in Woolworths with my granddad my dad's dad and um, I remember him pointing to it on the shelf and saying oh look have you, have you got that comic David and I went oh no I'd really like it he went okay you can have it so he bought it for me and I've still got that comic and people can can google my age and you'll know that this all happened 60 plus years ago, um, I've, st I've still got that comic. I still treasure it. It still is the thing that kind of sparked it all off for me. And actually, although the shop we bought it in, which was a Woolworths store, is no longer there in what was my hometown. It's no longer a Woolworths store, but I could still point to you the corner of that store where that comic book was. So that, that's like ground zero where it all went poof, um, and I was about, I don't know, seven, eight years old at the time. And that, and from that point on, I became even more obsessed with comics, particularly American comics, particularly superhero comics to, to begin with. Um, and at the same time, there were lots of British comics that were very attractive. There was, in particular, there was a comic called The Eagle, which was a weekly comic that stood out on the shelves because it had beautiful, really saturated, full colour covers and it featured Dan Dare, Pilot of the Future, science fiction, space hero. Um, and it was immaculately drawn. I later found out the guy who drew it and, and created it had a studio full of people. He had maybe six or seven people producing a couple of pages a week. So it was like something that was impossibly magically good that you could, even if you had your piece of paper and your pencil, the thought of ever drawing to that level was in, impossible really. So, yeah, from the age of about seven or eight onwards, I started to absorb all these all these things. So when you first started at the age of seven or eight, probably picking up a pencil, trying to copy these these pictures, I can see why you developed such a clean style, because all of the you know, all of the uh, uh, the comics that you mentioned had artists that had like really clean styles and really precise styles. That's the word that comes to my mind when I talk, when I think about your work is precision. Mm -hmm. And well, yeah, yeah that's good. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you say that's where it came from? Because I know you also became a surveyor. Yeah, well, um, my my dad um, used to do a comic at school when he was growing up, and the teacher would let him pin the comic on the board. And it's, I've actually got those comics that he drew, you know, literally, God, it must be a hundred years ago, something like get, getting on for a hundred years ago, which is incredible. I, I never actually thought about that before. 
But anyway, wow. and he, yeah, and, and he used to draw them and colour them and letter them, and they were very precise, very nice, really, really clean. And he was inspired in his turn by a guy called Henry Tallentire, who was a professional artist who drew for British comics and who lived in a boarding house in a place called Dundee in Scotland, where my dad for a short while also lived because his dad, the granddad that I talked about who brought me the Superman comic, was a customs officer and would get transferred around to different ports to administer the customs house. And my dad obviously was really struck by this artist, Talentai, who lived in the same boarding house. And he must have seen his comics. And I've subsequently seen some of Talentai's comics and they are super precise. They really are really clean. They're drawn same size as print and they're absolutely immaculate. So I think maybe my dad, you know, was exposed to that. He later went on to become um, an architect and he drew these very neat, precise, beautiful, beautiful plans uh, in, in ink. So we always had, you know, ink and paint and everything in, in the house. And I would look over his shoulder and then I went on to help him doing the lettering on these plans. So again, I got used to working very precisely in Indian ink that you couldn't easily erase. So I think, you know, my natural inclination, what I'd learned was to be quite, quite precise. Um, and yeah, I did mimic a lot of the American comic book artists to begin with. And they tended to draw in quite a clean way because they were drawing for the work to be published with color added to it. So they didn't have to do a lot of hatching or a lot of modeling or a lot of mid-tone work. So they tended to go for very clear outlines and you know very well designed areas of solid black. So I kind of worked in that way. Um, so I think um, those were the things that made me think to be neat and precise is the way to go. I sometimes prefer my work when it's less neat and precise. There's something about the sketches and the roughs that I do that I prefer to the finished work because it feels a bit kind of more organic sometimes. Uh, I, I don't want to be cr critical about my own stuff and, and obviously my stuff must be quite liked or I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. But I think those, those are the roots of my very precise and planned approach to drawing. I think your stuff being quite liked is an understatement considering <laughs> that you are, you, know, you are at least half responsible for what many consider to be the greatest comic of all time. But we'll get there. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, well, I'm just a, a, a typical modest English guy. What can I tell you? Ask me, <laughs> ask Brian Bolland, ask anybody. You know, we're not really quite sure we're good enough yet, you know. So I, under, so I understand where the precision comes from, but you you also do a lot of design work. Uh, like, mm -hmm. for example, on the originals, you do a lot of design work on the originals that would, looks like it could have come straight out of, of an advertising um, background. What, like, where does that, a part of your skill set come from? Well, I suppose from the beginning, because I wanted to tell stories in pictures and kind of emulate American comics, I would quite often only get as far as drawing the first page of a story. So I would sort of be designing logos or trying to give the story a certain look. I mean, I can look at things that I did when I was growing up and I can see almost when I first found Will Eisner's work, because all of a sudden, I start to have these kind of wonderful 3D logos that the characters are, are, are walking around. Or when I was infatuated by the work of Carmine Infantino, who drew these wonderful kind of idealized cityscapes and everything. Um, so, uh, you, you know, design was always a part of it. The kind of beyond the story or the drawing, the kind of flavor of, 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 of the artwork, the sort of approach that it had. And certainly with the things that I later did professionally, like Watchmen, like Give Me Liberty with Martha Washington, like the, the, the originals, they're, they're all designed to look like themselves and like nothing else at all. In other words, they're not a generic, the, say the, the covers in particular are not generic comic book covers with a, with a flashy logo and you know, an action figure. You know, they, they've all got a particular mood uh, and that, to me, is part of doing a comic book series, that you give it an identity. You know, you 
you, you, you've got the story, which is the basic figure, and you kind of dress it up in a certain way to, to look like a certain character of story. The thing with Watchmen was that we realised that the cover of Watchmen, we didn't have to have the logo across the top because it was for sale in comic book stores that would rack their books on a shelf. So you really needed to see the spine. So we did the Watchmen spine like that. And we decided that, I mean, I say we, I mean, obviously I actually designed it and drew it, but like everything with Watchmen, it came out of long discussions between me and, me and Alan. Also the nature of the imagery on the cover of Watchmen rather than superhero figures, which would have just looked like any other. We just didn't want Watchmen to look like every other superhero comic. It had to look different. And that was the reason for the nine panel grid as well, because a lot of comic books at that time did what I would call sort of poster page design where, you know, you had one key image and then lots of smaller images, which looks kind of exciting, but very often sacrifices the story for the immediate impact of, of the drawing. So the whole thing about Watchmen, the whole approach, before I even drew one of the panels, I, I'd figured out how it was going to look. Same for Martha Washington as well, which was much more free form. It was a much more exuberant, less meticulously planned thing. It was, you know, as I always say, when I'm comparing Alan Moore and Frank Miller, Alan is like Mozart. He's the great classical composer who's figured out all the notes, whereas Frank is more like Miles Davis, who's kind of, prepared to wing it if something interesting comes up to explore it if something doesn't work get rid of it and, and start again so that's very much the character of Martha Washington and when it came to the originals which was the thing that I did completely on my own it was it was about the mod movement of the 60s here in England and that was all about design that was all about you know, looking cool and everything looking very uh, stylish. So I had to come up with a design for that that echoed the content of the book. So I decided to do it in black and white, which yeah. is unusual. Most comics are in full colour, which immediately set it back. It immediately makes it look retro because it is black and white. And, it, and I had a very precise page grid that I drew it in, less formal than the Watchman page grid, but nevertheless, there was an underpinning which gives the pages a certain kind of cohesion and um, a certain rhythm. So yeah, to me, the design, the graphic design of these things has always been really, really um, important. Even if I'm just doing the balloon lettering, like in my early days, I, I did a lot of balloon lettering. The aesthetics of that were always very important to me having the lettering just the right size with the right amount of space around the letters, the right line thicknesses. You know, it's to do with stories, it's to do with legibility, and it's to do with almost an unconscious thing that you pick up from the design of the artwork. I am, uh, I, I am curious about the fact that most British uh, creators uh, from your generation are tend to work for DC more, and it seems like DC Comics resonates with them more than Marvel Comics. Is that to do with anything culturally, or is it just better distribution at the time the dc had better distribution or i suppose it might it might come back to what we're saying about how i like nice design and i try to emulate nice design i mean eventually dc comics and marvel comics were drawn by the same people printed on the same printing press the same letter as the same color so they became much less distinct distinguishable but when i first started seeing american comics like in the early 1960s, DC could err in the way of looking kind of too clean. Someone famously said that the trouble with DC comics was that they looked like they were drawn in a bank, which I know what I know what they mean. Yeah. Um, there was a clarity about the line work in DC comics and a certain um, exuberance about the colouring. But when you looked at a Marvel comic, particularly in the, the monster comics that immediately preceded the superhero comics and the very early superhero comics there was something kind of muddy about them the printing didn't look quite as good they'd use really dull colors on the covers like browns and grays that looked kind of murky um the the artwork although a lot of it was based on jack kirby who you know we all agree was the king of comics 
although a, a, a lot of it was penciled by Jack Kirby, quite often the, the inkers would look as if they'd had to draw it in a real hurry. So the, the drawing looked a little bit wonky. Um, the stories were a little less well thought out than DC stories. DC stories could be a bit cerebral and a little bit abstract and a little bit cold. But there was something about the design and the feel of a DC comic that, again, on the levels that I've been talking about with graphic design, kind of appealed to me more. And they did also have, like, two of the main kind of tent poles of superhero comics. They had Superman and Batman, and they were, you know, they were basically what all the other ca characters grew out of. All the superheroic characters grew out of Superman. There's no, no question, although, of course, they evolved and people contributed wonderful new twists and turns. But I think DC felt like the establishment, you know, the real comics, and Marvel was a kind of grubby interloper. I mean, later, as I say, things, things changed. And for a while, although generally DC were my favourites, uh, I got to appreciate, you know, what Kirby was doing. I particularly think of the kind of run of Fantastic Four with the Inhumans and the Doctor Doom stories in Galactus and Silver Surfer, which were really mind blowing and which took comics, you know, places that they'd never, never been before. But still, at the end of the day, I'm a DC guy. And obviously, most of the work I've done, I've got very good relationships with, with everybody at Marvel. And, you know, I, I count many of them as, as, as friends. But DC has always felt like home to me. And you know, I've always felt part of the family, although as Alan Moore would point out, it's occasionally a dysfunctional family. So I want to ask you about, about the other work that you've done with Alan in 2000 AD, uh, because what is the difference? Because you guys, because I'm interested in the buildup to Watchmen, I guess. It's like you guys did these five pagers, you know, Chrono Cops, the, the one with the time traveling, uh, yeah. the time traveler in his room with the, all of the time travels. And I feel like that all of that stuff is kind of a precursor to Watchmen, you know, because of because of Dr. Manhattan and the way everything ties together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was really interesting because um I I, I mean we can get into this later as well, but I, I've been working on my autobiography recently, which is due to come out later this year. So I've been looking back at a lot of my old artwork and trying to place it chronologically. And the thing was, I, you know, I'm a little bit older than Alan and I was a little bit ahead of him on the, on the curve. And the very first time I really read any of his work was when they sent me a script because I was kind of working two things at once. I was working for 2000 AD and I was working for Doctor Who monthly or Doctor Who weekly. So sometimes there would be little gaps in my schedule and I could take other work on and they, they liked my work up at 2018, told me that if I ever had any time, they were ha happy to give me jobs to do. Jobs that didn't have a particular deadline, the kind of um, inventory jobs. So I used to get lots of these sort of shock ending four or five page stories. And they were written by various people. But the first one I got from Alan was called, I believe, The Dating Game. And it was a, a, a Rojo's robo tale. And it was about a guy who... I don't know, I forget the exact story, but I remember when I read it, because they would very often give up and coming writers a chance with these little short stories, because there wasn't much to lose and they could actually see what, how their work translated into print. Um, and Alan was one of those writers who'd made contact with 2000 AD editorial and sort of sent in some of these shock ending stories. But I remember being really impressed by it because it was a kind of use of the language and a, an understanding of the way everything would work as a page that I found really uh, quite inspiring. You know, sometimes I'd get these scripts for these little short stories and think, well, this isn't really that good, so I'll just have fun. I'll just draw it however I like. But with what Alan did, I thought, yeah, he's put a lot of work into this. I think I should be putting a lot of work into it as well. So... You know, I said, well, I really like that last script. If you if you if you get any more stories by him, I you know, I would I'd love to draw them. And so I got several more to do. And of course, along the way, we got to know each other socially. Um, you know, we'd see each other maybe once a month. There was a, a comic show in London called the Westminster Comic Mart with a pub next door. So all of us comic guys that I mentioned before would go down there and end up in the pub afterwards. 
so I got to know Alan a bit and he's he's a lovely guy great great company a great raconteur a great storyteller um and he wrote a story called Chrono Cops which was kind of tailored to what I could do and it was it was as you say very like the Dr Manhattan issue of Watchmen in that it kind of went backwards and forwards in time it was it was a spoof based on the mad version of the dragnet characters so it's like these these cops who police space and time to make sure nothing went wrong but it all got messed up and so you'd see them multiple times like sometimes they'd be in the foreground and they'd be talking and other times they'd be in the background hiding behind a plant so you couldn't see them and I had to sort of draw the whole thing and cop you know xerox some of the panels and stick them in and change the lettering and it worked really well and and alan actually specifically said to me he said that he realized when he saw what i'd done with that story that i could draw anything he would ever want me to draw so i think when it came to watchman he knew that i would be able to draw the things that he wanted to talk about and to kind of bring that kind of higher level of design and com complex approach into the narrative. And so it, so it proved. Um, but what's interesting as, as well is because by the time he got established at 2000 AD, I'd kind of moved on to DC Comics. They came over and re recruited us. Uh, and I was sort of okay with the work that DC was giving me, but I thought oh, I'd really love to, to do something with, with Alan. Maybe I could get Alan into uh, American comics and we discussed and we talked about and Alan wrote outlines for um, a story which starred the challenges of the unknown who were DC's sort of space and time ancient mystery you know scientific mad scientists kind of thing you know that could get involved in, in the DC universe at all kinds of levels not the Fantastic and Four not not <laughs> very like the Fantastic Four I think maybe Jack Kirby who created the challenges of the unknown had them in mind when he designed the Fantastic Four. They were the precursors of the Fantastic Four, but it, it was a it was a story that kind of ranged all over the DC universe. And like Watchmen, it was a bit of a murder mystery. There was a bigger thing going on in the background, and I was going to pitch it to DC. And I spoke to the editor. I was in touch with her. He said, "Well, really, if it's challenges of the unknown, we've already promised that to somebody else." So we wouldn't really be interested in it. So that was a shame. So then we came up with this treatment of John Johns, Manhunter from Mars. He's the guy who's come from Mars at where, where he was a kind of policeman, I guess. And he's come to Earth in the 1950s or 1960s. And he's now a policeman on Earth. He looks like an Earth man, but he is actually a green-skinned alien. And Alan came up with this wonderful thing where it was set in McCarthyite, 1950s USA and it was a sort of paranoia thing where the detective the earth detective John Jones had been told to go and find out what was happening with these weird phenomena and these reports of there being an alien on the loose so it was it was a it was a really ironic kind of thing and it but again I said to DC hey we've got this treatment of John Jones and they went sorry we've already promised it to somebody so we almost got going on those Alan and I but then eventually Len Wein, the DC editor, and also the guy who created Swamp Thing for DC and Wolverine for Marvel, he phoned me up one night and said, hey, I'm trying to get in touch with this English writer called Alan Moore. You know, have you got a contact for him? So I gave him Alan's phone number and Len phoned him up and uh, Alan hung the phone up because <laughs> it, was, it was somebody playing a prank. Anyway, eventually Len talked talk to him and of course, as everybody watching this knows, you know, um, he gave him Swamp Thing to, to, to write and the rest literally is history. Alan took what was a, a, a character that was kind of dying on its feet and absolutely broke the mold and came up with something which went to, you know, areas that comics, particularly DC comics, had never been to be, be before. And well, frankly, from that completely revolutionized the industry. So yeah, those things we did for 2018, and in particular Chrono Cops, were the kind of precursors. And we, we were always, it was like we were always trying to work together and trying to work for DC Comics. That is very generous of you. I see that 
you're saying that Swamp Thing was the was the one that changed the the medium because which is true it did um yeah yeah no no i mean not to say that other things and i suppose you're yeah. alluding to watchman hadn't yeah. it, hadn't it, hadn't it, hadn't it, but something like swamp thing that on the face of it was sort of quite unpromising and quite unlikely it wasn't like alan took over superman but it may have been you see the fact that Sw the swamp thing was dying they had nothing to lose whatever alan did and no disrespect to the people who've been writing it up to them but it, it was kind of a character that had run its course it had a really good introduction when Len Wein was writing it when Bernie Wrights and, and later Nesta Redondo were, were, were drawing it but then it kind of faltered and it they almost like told all the stories that they had to tell so that DC in a way had nothing to lose by giving this to Alan and of course he kicked it out out of the park I mean he just did stuff that DC could never never have imagined so when, and they were so impressed that it was actually that, I think, that led to them saying to him, look, we've bought the Charlton characters. We want something to do with those. You've done a hell of a job on revitalising Swamp Thing. Do you want to see what you can do with the Charlton characters? And Alan, of course, being a died in the wool comics fans, understood the, the Charlton characters. But then the first treatment that he did for them was essentially what became Watchmen. And, of course, yeah. we were showing these characters, or Alan was showing these characters, as being psychotic or being murderous or even being dead. And I think that was a little bit, bit too much for DC, who had just paid, you know, a sum of money to own these characters, to have Alan immediately <laughs> kill them and maim them and show them to be complete, you know, fuck ups. So um, um, they then said, well, OK, you and Dave do something that's your version of those, those kind of characters. Yeah. And that was brilliant because then we were free as well. These characters that Alan and I made up had no particular intrinsic value to DC Comics. They weren't a property that they were relying on to sell their comics, like a Superman or a Batman or a Green Lantern or a Flash. You know, really, we could only do harm within a limited sandbox. So it was, it was actually a brilliant thing that we didn't do the Charlton characters, where we would have done a reverential, slightly more reverential, over the shoulder look that we were able just to come up with fresh stuff like we've come up with fresh stuff for the future shocks and time twister tales that we did for two, 2000 AD so in, in a way yeah Watchmen w w without Swamp Thing there wouldn't have and what Alan did with that I don't think there would have been Watchmen did you uh I saw that you did some 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 pages for Swamp Thing like to try out was that yeah. how come that didn't push through well, uh, you know, Len, I, because obviously Swamp Thing was pretty close to Len's heart as he was one of the creators of it. And um, he phoned me up and said, would I do a sample page of Swamp Thing? And I did. But you were alluding earlier to my very precise way of drawing. S precise drawing in muck monsters somehow doesn't quite fit. And the Swamp Thing that I drew looked like a cleaned up version of even the Nesta Redondo version, which itself was a slightly shinier version of what Bernie Wrightson had originally done. And it was clear to me, although I gave it my best shot, when I was doing that sample page, that it, it wasn't, re wasn't really for me. I, I've, you know, I, I love science fiction. I've never been big on fantasy and I've never been big on monsters and horror, you know. So I was a bad choice for that. But as it turned out, you know, Alan, who was the second Englishman that Len tried to get to revitalise it, he obviously was the man for the job and did something that I never could have approached. I've always, so that's that's the thing, uh, you know, Alan worked with Steve Bissett and John Toddleben on that. I've always thought Alan's biggest strength as a writer was knowing the strengths of his artists. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that characterizes Alan is his ability to absorb information and stories and to get to the heart of what things are about, to understand things really well. In other words, although he's known for writing and as it were, talking, speaking, his skill is actually listening. His skill is reading stuff and taking stuff on board and seeing it clean and seeing it in a fresh way. Um, and so I think, um, you, you know, that's really how he was able to take these 
moribund characters and turn them into something that felt new because he identified things that other writers, other artists hadn't, hadn't identified. I mean, that classic two issue kind of couplet where, where he finished off Superman, the Silver Age Superman, his, his understanding of what made that Superman world so magical is absolutely spot on. You know, he, he emphasized and highlighted just the things which gave that value and which gave that charm and which gave it excitement. And it, it was, I've, I've always been rather amused by that because John Byrne, who's obviously, uh, you know, a very accomplished cre cre creator, hugely popular at one time and an amazing talent, one of the great talents of modern comics. Um, um, what was, what was he got rid of all yeah. those. Yeah, he'd, he'd been asked to relaunch Superman. So he came up with, you know, an exciting new variation on Superman. But Alan's two last Superman issues came out the, like the month before and completely blew anything that John was going to do out of the water as far as I was concerned, because Alan actually hit something magical, whereas John was doing like a kind of a, not a workmanlike, but kind of, okay, we want to revitalise this character, so change everything, everything must be changed. And it kind of, as we were saying, England threw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, the clunky stuff got thrown out. But in a way, the magical stuff got, got thrown out as well. Um, whereas, you know, Alan, you know, just put the lid, put the final lid and said, this was great. This was great when Superman was, was like this. And that's all finished now. And here's the next, you know. So I, I wouldn't want to come across as denigrating what John did because he, he did, he, you know, he freshened the, the whole thing up and his work, you know, stands up very well even today. And he came up with twists and turns that are still utilised in this day, Superman. But I always thought that Alan kind of took the ground out from under his feet by quite nonchalantly doing a two issue thing that just kind of was like one of the best Superman things ever done. I will say as great as whatever happened to the man of tomorrow is, I don't think it's the best Superman story Alan wrote. So you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I do. I do. And I was, even as I was saying it, I was just think, th thinking that I'd left it dangling there for you to pay us a compliment. But um, yeah. And of course, what you're alluding to is, is Alan and I did yeah. the Superman story. For the man for who the has man, everything. For the man who has everything. And um I mean, that to me was a career high because as we've established, Superman was my introduction to American comics. And I loved the character from the very beginning. He is the daddy of, of, of them all, there's, there's no question. And I've told this story before and I tell it again in my autobiography, but briefly, um, the first American comic convention that DC ever paid for me to go to in Chicago in, I believe, 1984 um, was after I'd read Alan's treatment and outline of Watchmen. And I went to the DC party on the opening night of the convention. And I went up to Dick Giordano, the managing editor, who I got to know a little bit and said, hey, Dick, this new thing that Alan's writing, I'd like to draw it. Is that possible? And he said, well, what does Alan think about it? I said, he'd like me to draw it. And Dick said, then it's yours. So. That was that. So it's like, fantastic. I'm going to be working on this great story with my favourite writer. And then I literally bumped into Julius Schwartz, who was the editor of Superman comics at, at that time. And he said, hey, Dave, when are you going to draw me some Superman? And I went, any, any time you like, uh, Julius. Who, who's going to write it? He said, who do you want to write it? I said, Alan Moore. He went, yeah, sure, fix it up. So we went back after the convention to New York and I went into the DC offices for the first time and from the phone on Julie Schwartz's desk I phoned Alan up and said hey you know um, I'm going to be doing Watchmen with you he said yeah great oh, that, that's great and I said and also Julie Schwartz has, has, has offered us a chance to do a Superman story he went yeah I've got just the story and I kind of knew the story because as I say Alan is a great raconteur and he's happy to tell you the plots of all the books he's got coming down the line and at one of these comic marts, he talked to me for quite a long time about this idea he had for a story. What if Krypton hadn't exploded? What if, you know, Superman had never come to be? What would have happened to the Kryptonian civilization? How would Superman have lived out his life? 
and it all sounded great. So I knew that he kind of had this Superman story. And um, that was just brilliant because he was my favorite character, my favorite artist, my favorite writer, well, my favorite artist, obviously, my, my favorite writer and my favorite editor because Julie Schwartz had edited all the comic books that I loved as a kid. Flash, Green Lantern, Atom, Justice League, Strange Adventures, Mystery in Space, the list goes on. Um, and so it was wonderful. And the fact that it was a one-off story, we didn't have to support a lot of continuity. We told a kind of a detached story that was complete in 40 pages in a Superman hand. And it was almost like, this is our take on Superman. There it is, job done. Uh, and so for all those reasons, uh, and I know it's a favorite story of a lot of people and I'm, I'm really glad that we we hit it, you know, and that so many people do like it. But I'd have to say of all the things I've done, it's one of my very, very favorite things. Did you ever see the uh, the animated adaptation of it? Yeah, I did. What, what they, did they, they, they actually called me up and said they, you know, they were going to do it. How did I feel about it? And I, I said, oh, that should be great because I, I knew the showrunner was Bruce Tim, who's an incredible artist in his in his own right. And they did a really good version of it. And they, of course, they, sh they pared the whole thing down to be much more brief. Uh, but I think the way they did it, it kind of, it was better than a straight adaptation of the story. It really fitted what they were able to do with the um, animation. And they even sent us a, um, a check, you know, uh, it, it wasn't a huge check, but at least it was an acknowledgement that what they'd done was based on on, on our story and uh, yeah it was, re it was really great to see my pictures just kind of kind of come to life so a good experience all around. One of the things that I find one of the more what if scenarios that, that I've been ruminating on I think it was when I spoke to Rick Veach because um, it was pretty well known that you're a big Superman fan that Alan's a big Superman fan and of course Watchmen came out when it did like why did DC simply never offer the two of you an extended run on Superman? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, there was a point with DC. Uh, and again, although I've kind of worked a bit of the chronology of this, I'm a bit vague on this. There was a time actually when Alan and I went to New York together, the only time we went to New York together. I think it may have been Alan's only trip to the USA, but we we were in New York and we met up with, we were friendly by this time with Frank Miller and Howard Chaikin and um, Walt Simonson. And there was this plan to revitalize the whole of the DC line. And like Frank Miller was going to do Superman. No, no, he was going to do Batman. And Alan, and Alan was going to do Superman, but not with an artist attached at this point. So I wasn't attached to doing Superman at that point. And Howard Shakin was going to revive some of the other characters. And it was this idea to do a complete overturning of the whole of the DC line. Um, but it never actually came to anything, but it was talked about and it sounded really exciting to me at the time. And no doubt if I got the feeling it was going to happen, I maybe would have lobbied to say, hey, can Alan and I do this together? But the problem was, I think by that time, we'd started on doing Watchmen. Mm. I think we had. And clearly, although Alan could have written Superman as well, I never could have drawn it. But there was, yeah, there was just this brief instant where all these things were kind of mooted, but never actually came about. But again, there is a difference between doing a one-off and encapsulating everything you felt. Like I was able to encapsulate just the way I thought Superman should look. And we saw, we saw Krypton and it was like the definitive statement for me rather than have to write ongoing continuity, which eventually is very tiring as well. So not that the quality of the work starts to slip, but you have to have fill in artists or the whole thing gets jumbled up in schedules and, and things. So in retrospect, although I would have loved to have done more Superman with Alan, what we did do was just kind of perfect. It was a perfect moment that we never got bogged down in the difficulties of doing an ongoing book. So. I think, yeah, I was very happy with the way it turned out. Have you seen the meme going around where they take one of your For the Man Who Has Everything sequences? It's the one where Clark Cal tells his son that he's not real and people photoshopped it so that it's an older Calvin talking to Hobbes. 
I, I have seen this. I mean, pe people are always doing that. I, 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 I lose track of it. Yeah, there's some funny people out there on, on the internet. And I mean that in both senses of the word. <laughs> some people are like, is this real? It's like, no, it's yeah. not real. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And of course, you know, pe 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 people are so skilled with Photoshop and everything these days. They can make you think, did I really draw that? No, surely not. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, of course, another thing that you did with Alan is uh, Mogo doesn't socialize. Uh, and I'm interested in this because it reads 100 percent like a 2080 future shock. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, and and Alan actually wrote quite a few of those Green Lantern backup stories. He had, he did a fantastic one, didn't he, with um, Kevin O'Neill about yeah. having uh, the the original Green Lantern who passed his ring on to Hal Jordan. See, I've got all this DC stuff in my head. It's years since I've already thought about this. But anyway, Abin Sir, yeah, uh, and um, the F sharp bell. Sorry? And, the, and the F sharp bell is the other yes. storyline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and and so uh, again, they were short stories, and again, nothing was at stake. You could do anything you like in one of those Green Lands and cool things. It didn't affect the the overall position of the, the DC universe. And Alan, of course, had become very skilled at telling wonderfully economic, really pointed, you know, short stories. Um, and they were always a joy to do. And, Mo, Mogo was so off the wall, the idea that, and the perfectly logical idea that you, should, you could have a Green Lantern the size of a planet. Um, I mean, I got some amusement later when, when I worked on the Green Lantern Corps and we, we used Mo, Mogo. Right. His sidekick, because we established that every sector of the universe would have two Green Lanterns in it. So we had Mogo, the planet, and his sidekick or his partner was called Buzzt. B double Z T B, B, B double Z T as I would really say. It was this tiny little insect, and it just amused me. He had this planet and this tiny insect who were a team. You know, they both could do do what the other one couldn't do. So yeah, no, I, I mean Alan's so inventive, and he does really shine in that kind of very succinct, very focused, very surprising and insightful sort of short take on things i mean to, to 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 be honest dc could have employed him as an as an ideas man just to just to come up with new concepts for their characters and they would have profited from it whether alan would have been up for doing that whether the other writers could have done him justice perhaps not but alan just generates i i ideas in an amazingly sort of fertile way does it surprise you that mogo who i assume you two co-created as a joke is now super used throughout the DC universe because I assumed you guys just came up with them for that ending, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was just, yeah. I mean, I mean it, it was just, just like a joke. It was. It, it wasn't. It wasn't anything. Oh, this is going to become a cornerstone of one of the major DC franchises or, or something like. That. Because the thing I would say about Mogo, he's really easy to draw because he's basically just a sphere, you know, with a, with a Green Lantern symbol on it. Um, but yeah, yeah. But it, but but again, you know, I, I've always liked the Green Lantern Corps as as an idea, and it lends itself to variety, and it lends itself to glimpses of things that you might not be able to sustain at great story length. So I think, he, yeah, he was a good contribution to that, and certainly um, the one Green Lantern you'd never mistake or never lose in a crowd, you know. I will ask uh, only a few questions about Watchmen, mainly because every time I Googled to prepare for this interview, I feel like 98.75% of the questions that have ever been asked your way are about, are about Watchmen. I'm but, sure we can get to that last 1.25%. <laughs> um, you are the co-creator, the artist, the letterer, the designer, and really the co-writer of Watchmen with the world building and all of the other nuances that you guys put in. Do you feel that in, wait, that, no, that's a leading question. Do you, <laughs> I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it will infringe my fifth amendment rights. Now go on. Do you feel that you get enough credit for Watchmen? I've got no complaints with Watchmen at all. And the thing that I would say is that, as you've noticed, even with this interview, Alan 
just like me, is scrupulous in saying when we did this, when we created that, when, you know, and that is the truth of the matter. It was a, it was a co-creation. And as Alan once memorably said, the, 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 the only way that you can look upon it is, it's, is a joint creation. You know, you, if you start to say, well, I created that or I did that bit, or we never would have done that if I hadn't done this, you get yourself almost into the position where you're like, pe people who are married are now having an argument about who bought the couch or who's who owns the DVDs, you know. So, you know, obviously there are things that Alan created out of whole cloth, stuff that I create created out of old cloth, uh, out of new cloth and old cloth as well, probably. Um, but, you know, Watchmen is our joint creek creation and that's the only way you could look at it and the only way that Alan and I have ever looked at it. One of the problems comes, I think, with journalists, and I don't want to piss journalists off, but journalists are about writing. And the shorthand is because Alan wrote it, he created it. And like you would with an illustrated book, somebody, mm -hmm. me, added the illustrations afterwards. So Alan wrote it and I added some, some illustrations. What upsets me about that is not so much me losing share of the credit, but as it, sh it shows a basic misunderstanding of what comics are about. Comics aren't yeah. stories that exist in a solid and abstract and complete form that you then add, you know, pretty pictures to or that you dress up in pictures. The way comics work, the, the words and the pictures are inextricably linked and you can't really separate them. So that's the thing that upsets me the most about it is that, you know, they're not getting comics. They're not getting what it is to be a comics writer or it is to be a comics artist. And sometimes, yeah, you know, it, it will tend to be Alan Moore's Watchmen, like it'd be Alan Moore's Swamp Thing or Frank Miller's Batman Year One or, you know, it, it, but I think if you work in the business and you know people in the business, we're never, and anybody who, who matters to me, they know the truth of it anyway. Um, so, it, it, it isn't anything that I'm seriously concerned about. Once upon a time, I would occasionally correct journalists. If I had a good relationship with, with, with a journalist, I'd say, you know, you, you know that Alan and I did this between us, so why have you only mentioned his name? And they'd be, oh, Dave, I'm really sorry, and they try and redress the balance. But after a while, I stopped even doing that because, you know, as I say, anybody whose opinion really mattered to me knew the truth of the situation anyway. Yeah, I asked I asked Brian Ballin the same question too because I said that I feel like when Len Wein died and um, and Alan publicly denounced the Killing Joke, mm -hmm. journalists and fans were like, "Well, that's it; those are the people we ask about the Killing Joke." And I'm like, mm -hmm. "There's one other person here who was heavily involved in this." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it yeah, it just shows, um, as I say to me, an, an ignorance of what comics are about. Um, but be, but beyond that, and I mean. You know, Watchmen has treated me very well. I mean, we never in our wildest dreams Im imagined the the success of Watchmen commercially and critically. It's 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 obviously gone on and on having new editions and new versions through through the years, and being something that's visible and making money for much much longer than anybody could possibly have, have imagined. Because of its popularity, I've been all over the planet to conventions and I've met all sorts of wonderful and interesting people. So, I mean, I really, I couldn't Im imagine uh, that I would have wanted the Watchmen journey to have been any other way, other than I wish Alan was still on board. Um, I understand perfectly why he isn't on board. Um, but apart from that, I, as somebody who always loved comics, to have been half of something that had such a profound effect on comics is something I would never have dreamed of or thought possible. So, yeah, I, I've got no complaints, really. I know, uh, you know, the main reason that is pointed to that Alan isn't on board is because of the con the contractual issue. You guys signed a contract that said if, if Watchmen goes out of print for, for a year, then the rights will revert back to you. Yep. Um, but honestly, how could you have predicted that? Because you guys are the first, Watchmen was the first one that got reprinted every year, wasn't it? Well, that's true. I, you, you know, this is a thorny question. And I mean, obviously people have their theories about and their 
versions of what happened with Watchmen and the contracts and what we signed and what DC did. And I generally try to stay a little bit out of the controversy about this, mainly because like anything on the, on the internet, you just, it's like a tar baby, you know, you just get, get dragged down by it. Alan's spoken quite volubly about it online and I've been tempted to respond to things that he said because they don't tally with my recollection of what was said. But one of the things I've done with my autobiography is to actually address these issues and to set out for the first time the way I saw things, the way I remember things happening. And as far as the contract is concerned, we got sent the contract by DC, and as you just pointed out, this was a kind of groundbreaking thing because, you know, they'd never commissioned things like Watchmen before, and they certainly had never, ever had graphic novels or mass trade paperback reprintings of, of, of stuff. So it was all uncharted territory. And the contract that they sent us, compared to anything we'd ever seen in comics, looked great because they were going to give us reprint money, they were going to give us royalties. And we signed it quite happily. I'd have to say, Alan signed it more eagerly than me. We got the, sent the contract, and I phoned him up a couple of days later to say, hey, about this contract, there's a couple of things in it that I, I don't sit very well. He said, oh, I've already signed it. I said, well, <laughs> he hadn't sent it, fortunately, but he'd already signed it. And I said, well, there's a couple of things. And it was, a th it was a particularly involved thing to do with royalties that uh, is a bit too complex to, to go into. And it did have this clause in it, which said that if it went out of print, the rights would, would revert to us, which is a very standard clause in a book publishing contract. And it's designed to protect the creator. It's, it's designed to protect the writer and, and, and the artist to say that, hey, if we stop publishing this work, we don't want to inhibit you from continuing to get income on it. So if we don't publish an edition for two years, you can do what you like with it. And it has since happened with things at DC. I worked on a series with Garth Ennis where we got the rights back because the publication had lapsed. So it was a thing that was done in a very positive way to try and in, in, ensure that, you know, if, and nobody knew that, that Watchmen was going to be the success it was, but it was the thing to say, well, you know, if we if we stop publishing it, you can still publish it somewhere else, which I think anybody would agree was a very writer and artist friendly thing to do. But of course, it never went out of print because from the very beginning, it was very successful. And DC never had any reason to not go back to print with it and to, to keep it in print. And obviously, because it had been so well received, it was a thing that in perpetuity was going to have, have a value. But I don't think they ever printed um, editions of it just to keep the rights. I honestly believe they reprinted it because they they could sell it, which again is perfectly acceptable. So that was kind of my take on the whole thing. Um, and we were able later, although Alan might not even be aware of it, we were able to, particularly when things happened like the digital recolouring of it and things happened with the movie and uh, before Watchmen and after Watchmen and whatever, all the other things were concerned. I did have my lawyer renegotiate the contract a bit. So we got slightly better terms than we'd had right at the beginning. We were able to include John Higgins in on it as well, because mm. he never got royalties to begin really? with. Really? So, well, it just wasn't standard practice. You know, letters and colorists didn't get royalties. And John went into it completely clear-eyed, he knew he wasn't going to get a royalty from it, but it was great when they came to do the digital recolouring of it, which was shortly before the movie, that the huge sales that the movie generated meant that John benefited from it as well. And I honestly don't know if Alan's checked his royalty statements, but we, you know, because, because I renegotiated it, we, we, have got, we are on slightly better terms. We haven't got own ownership of it, but we're on slightly better terms than, than we were in the first place. So it's not like it was a thing that was never changed or never modified in any way at all. Um, and yeah, I wish we'd had a better contract. I never would have signed a contract like that now. If I knew then what I know now, I never would have signed it. But we did it in good faith. I believe that DC did it in good faith. 
um, and things turned out in a way that nobody perhaps could quite have anticipated. Yeah, I feel like if it had been for, just just for example, if you'd come up with it, like let's say 20, 10, 10 years later, maybe, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, the same the same clause applies, and they're like, well. We're not going to reprint it, but we're going to put it out on the internet every year, mm -hmm. and and so it would have been the same thing, and you would have had no idea that that was going to happen. No, uh, no. So, so you know, but as I say, I explore this in more detail in my autobiography. So, if people are really interested in the in the ins and outs of it, uh, then that 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 would be the place to look. But as but as I say, I generally, as I know what actually went on, and and and. And I know what I saw and what I agreed to and what the way I perceived the, the whole thing. I generally try to stay out of the controversies about it. And a lot of people kind of misunderstand it. And it's so tempting. You think, no, you, abs you haven't got that right. That isn't what happened. That isn't the sequence of events. That isn't the reason why this happened or that happened. It's so hard to stay out of the, the, the dispute. But I know that it's just you'd be bogged down forever trying to keep the internet completely happy. When you see fans on the internet talking about comic book history, like how much do we actually know? <laughs> what would you say? Well, of course. And of course, we're talking about things that happened 30, 40 years ago. People's memories change. Again, we're doing my autobiography. I've, I call my autobiography confabulation because there's a thing that human beings do when they're recounting events, they confabulate. They actually change things around to make a better story of it. And, and I became aware when I was doing this that, yeah, that there's the way I thought things happened in the past. Actually, now I look at the publication dates and I look at the convention dates, that couldn't quite have happened, but I could have sworn it did. So I think you there is people recollecting things wrongly. There is people joining dots and not actually coming up with the right pattern. Um, but I, I do think it's fascinating. I mean, I'm always fascinated by these controversies of the past. I mean, coming back to Superman, the whole Siegel and Schuster thing, you know, the way that they, they were treated, the way they were mistreated, really, is, is a salutary thing. I, I really enjoyed a book called, I think it's called Men of Tomorrow, which went into a lot of the the early days of the comic book industry. And from the very beginning, there's been this, this conflict between the dreamers who are kind of innocent babes in the woods and the hardened businessmen who are only after the dollar, you know. And yeah, sure, at the time when I entered comics, there was a, a lot of that about. I think things have greatly improved now. I think also the fact that all us artists talk to each other. I think the fact that there's the internet there to kind of, you know, be kind of a point of reference and a point of record and certainly a, a way that people can you know try and dig to the truth I think that's that's helped as well but yeah I I'm I'm sure we could all have been treated better and I, I know we all could have been treated better we all could have been treated worse as well on balance I can't really grumble I have a few uh, what if questions relating to Watchmen, like I just maybe spec speculative. What if you had stuck with the original design for Rorschach? <laughs> I'd have got sick of draw drawing that. It, 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 was, it was a thing that, that was a whim. It was, you know, we thought, hey, supposing Rorschach was like a kind of flasher and he, and he had, you know, like a trench coat on and, and trouser legs that only started at his knees and that he would come up to you in the dark alley and flashes Rorschach blot at you. And I went as far as drawing it, but I think the minute I drew it, we both realized, nah, that's not gonna look good. And it's a hellishly difficult thing to draw as well. If, if it's just a face thing moving, then you accept it. But if every time you looked at it, you think, is that part of his clothing or part of his anatomy or is that a pattern or, or what? It would have been far too distracting. And really Rorschach was about what he said and what he thought rather than his physicality. So. It would, it would have been um, unnecessary. But sometimes you have to try an idea out. You have to, as I say, run it up the flagpole to see if anybody claps. And in this particular instance, we didn't clap. You saw, um, you know, you, you and you, you, you guys created Watchmen and uh, because of the, the Charlton characters, uh, 
what would have happened if you had used the Charlton characters? Do you think it would have uh, landed the same or been received the same way? No, I don't, because frankly, I don't think anybody really cared about the Charlton characters by that point. And I mean, with all due respect to the late Dick Giordano, who did a lot of work at Charlton and who was hired by DC on the basis of the good work that he'd done at Charlton. Charlton always had a sort of second string kind of feel to it. It was never on that same shelf as DC or Marvel or even Gold Key and things like that. They, they, they were pretty, they, they sort of lacked drama somehow and they always seemed to be a little more kind of jumbled and, and sort of unfocused. And they, the characters they had were, were kind of a weird mishmash. There were the sort of Steve Ditko characters that were quite strong, like Mr. A and um, Captain Atom, you know, the, 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 mainly due to Ditko's art looked interesting. And then were weird costumes like the Peacemaker's costume, which I know is now returned to movies, but a ridiculous costume. And they had the Blue Beetle who'd been one of these kind of also ran superheroes who've been kicking around from company to company from his creation in the 40s or, or, or whenever it was. So they were a real mishmash. But in the first treatment that, 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 that Alan wrote, we were going to make an attempt at being true to the continuity of these characters that I think would have absolutely messed the whole project up because really oh. the continuity wasn't that interesting. But instead, what, what we were able to do was to sort of distill the essence of those kind of characters. And we realized that with the Charlton characters, we had the kind of archetypes of superheroic personas. So you had your kind of military hero, your spy hero, which was the comedian, and you had your, you know, vigilante, which was the equivalent of Mr. A, or the question, you know, the Steve Ditko questions, and that was Rorschach. And you had Nightel, who was your sort of Batman, Blue Beetle kind of character. So we found that very conveniently that they gave us basic archetype characters that we could then fit exactly to the story we wanted to tell, not be bogged down by continuity, hint at our own continuity. Um, and so really the best thing that could have happened was that we were able to dispense with all the continuity, to dispense with the specifics of the characters and just use their kind of uh, archetypal essence. How do you feel about the fact that Rorschach is the most popular character in the book? Uh, well, I kind of un I understand that. And also I have to tell you, he's the easiest character to draw in the whole book. So he I must have drawn, I've drawn thousands of, of Rorschachs. He seems to be popular because he's the easiest one to draw, even if people don't specifically ask for a sketch of Rorschach, which they do 70% of the time. I will occasionally tend to force one on them by saying, you want to sketch, who do you want to sketch of Rorschach? And they'll go, oh yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, 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 Rorschach. So, I mean, I'm responsible for the proliferation of Rorschachs everywhere. God knows how many I've drawn. It must be tens of thousands by now. But I think the thing about Rorschach is he's obviously psychotic. He's obviously very deeply flawed and he's, you couldn't really agree with any of his political or social ideas. But he's got the thing about him which a lot of despots and a lot of antisocial people have got great certainty. And that's the thing that unfortunately is appealing to a lot of people. You know, uh, I don't know whether I agree with him, but at least he knows what he stands for. You know, it's always been, been the appeal of, you know, uh, despots throughout history. And I think Rorschach is like that. You can't agree with what he says but you think oh my god he's got this all worked out there is a space that runs on his ideas that's completely coherent and he absolutely completely believes in and again very much the inspiration of that was uh, Ditko's Mr A which is there is black and there is white and there is no grey um, so I can see for that reason why he's he's popular plus because he is so awful there's a certain attraction in 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 that and at the end of the day out of all the heroes he is the one who is the hero sacrificing his life sorry spoiler uh, and and uh, you know actually even in the face of armageddon just doing what he believes is right by his conscience do you um 
you know, Alan always talks about how the first page of issue three was when the book took off for him, uh, because that was when he realized that you could just put in all of these things in the background that just mm-hmm. echoed off of each other. Do you have a mm-hmm. similar moment? Is it the same moment when you realized that this book was something special? Yeah, it, it, it was round about then that we started to get into the sort of meta, n- not not in the Facebook term, term of the word meta, but meta, you know, the greater all-encompassing view, view of it. The, yeah, maybe we're doing something about superheroes, but we're also doing something kind of about comics, and we're using the tropes and the tricks of comics to do something which is sort of self-referential. I mean... One of the things about this, and I, I actually, I can still remember the look on Zack Snyder's face when I told him this, because he hadn't previously realised it. And he'd just come away from, it, it was after the movie was out and we were at some press junket in the San Diego Comic-Con or something. And, and he'd, he'd just spent a couple of years trying to boil down all this story of Watchmen into something that would fit in a, three-hour movie you know and even then it was it was a long movie and I told him that in that that Alan hadn't realized to begin with that it was a 12-issue miniseries he thought it was a six-issue miniseries and then he thought oh my god I've got to fill another six issues which is why the structure of Watchmen is you get an issue of plot an issue of character an issue of plot an issue of character so we suddenly had all these extra issues to fill up. I mean, the, 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 there was a possible world of watch and where none of that, none of those issues were there. It was just the story issues and we just went briskly through it. But of course, it wouldn't have been Watchmen then and it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have had all the favourite stuff of most people in it if we'd just gone for the story. So um, I think that was part of the reason that once we got going on it, Alan thought, I'm going to run out of stuff really quickly here if I write it the way I planned it. So it was an idea of how would you fill the space in a way that was valid, not that wasn't just filler, that wasn't just taking twice as long to have exactly the same effect. And it had been uh, a thing that had occurred to me when we were planning Watchmen that maybe in the world of Watchmen, there weren't superhero comics because there were heroes all over the place and it was a bit passe and a bit real life that they'd have something that was equally uh, colourful and swashbuckling. And when I thought of the word swashbuckling, I thought, oh, pirates, maybe they could have pirate comics. That'd be interesting. And if you look at issue one of Watchmen, there is a scene in it where the two detectives are walking out of the comedian's apartment building. And there is a kid, not the same kid, not the black kid that we see who becomes, you know, one of the mainstay characters, but a kid with a weird sort of winged helmet on or something. And he's reading a pirate comic. So we kind of touched upon it, but then I think Alan thought, this is a way we could have a sort of a, a referential story. We could show people reading comics. We could we could have a metaphorical thing about what Adrian Veidt is actually doing, the way that he's trying to do good, but it's actually just gonna cause destruction, the fact that there's dead bodies, you know, and, and, a, and a way of kind of giving, giving an echo or giving a sort of a, a, a um, yeah, and an, an, an analogy of what was what was going on, and yeah, and that really started. That's the first issue, the the first panel of issue three, I think, is a pirate ship sail, is it, or the second panel? Um, and and it was at that point that we really got going on it, and that we thought, um, yeah, we've we've got the space to be a little more interesting about it. We've got a space to do. A little bit more than just tell the story what do you think uh i mean would you say pound for pound uh panel for panel would you was watchmen more difficult to to make than than other comics because i'm looking at it sometimes and i'm like this must have been exhausting with all of the callbacks and all of the repeated poses the five maybe panels where rorschach has the same face and you uh yeah. yeah I mean, I'm astonished now. I look back at what we did there and I can't believe it. And I mean, even to put aside the work that I was putting into drawing it, Alan was writing Watchmen as a monthly or bi-monthly comic, although it appeared monthly. You know, he'd have to write one of those every couple of months to, to keep up with me. And he was also doing Swamp Thing and he was doing other stuff for DC and he was doing The Killing Joke 
it's just, the amount of work we did in that period was just amazing but then we, it was it's a cliche it was right place right time we were experienced enough that we could work to a high standard and we perfected the way of doing that our approaches our method of doing comics we 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 sort of had in place we were also doing exactly what we wanted to do there was no sense of having to write or draw to someone else's specifications we could make it exactly what we wanted we were in our early 30s so we had all the energy of youth as as, as well i mean on watch when i was doing four pages of that a week four pages pencil ink lettering a week i mean if I could do that in a month now, I would be happy. So we were working really fast, but we were we were on a roll, and we knew what we was what we were doing was good. The the most pressure came from other people's expectation because because the first few issues were received so well. It was oh my god, we've got a tiger by the tail. We've got to keep doing this, and we've got to keep it consistent. So that to me was the thing to keep it consistent. And there was also the thing about it that until we'd done the whole thing. We didn't have anything because you couldn't have a fill-in issue. You know, you, if Alan missed an issue, we just couldn't have done anything. If I couldn't have drawn it and they got somebody else off the DC taxi rank to do it, it would have just killed killed the whole thing. So it was it was until we had done everything, we hadn't done anything at all. But yeah, but I think it was the enthusiasm, it was the energy of youth, it was the, the knowledge that we were doing something that was to us special uh that kept us going how do you uh how do you feel about the fact that it is taught in you know universities and colleges for both english and art and also like it's constantly in the conversation for being the greatest comic that's ever been created yeah well i mean one one could only be sort of thrilled and flattered by that i mean the very notion of comics being taught in an educational background was was wasn't anything that particularly occurred to us at the time and didn't really occur i suppose you know that one of the advantages of watchman is that it is a complete work that it's a thing that stands on its own like a novel i mean it is truly a graphic novel although it was written and originally presented in, in an episodic form it is genuinely a graphic novel it's got a beginning a middle and an end you come into it knowing nothing and you go out of it having had the whole story told to you it's you know some things that are presented as graphic novels are actually just collections of stories which isn't the same thing at all so i suppose it is a thing that can be taught in the context of regular english literature um yeah i i, I mean again that's something which was a complete surprise to us but a thing which we can only be very happy about and hopefully I mean, I know a lot of comic book shops, you know, kind of recommend Watchmen to people as being the thing to start with, you know, read, read Watchmen. It's like reading, I don't know, War and Peace or I don't know, The Grapes of Wrath or something. You know, it's kind of, you must read this. If you're, gonna, if you're only gonna read one thing, you must read this. So I, I think it gets recommended for that. Um, I think also the fact that a lot of people who are, has subsequently, subsequently made it big in the entertainment industry were Watchmen fans, you know, I think that keeps it alive yeah. um, as well and keeps it feeling current that people are constantly referring to it. I mean, Damon Lindelof's HBO series, I mean, Lost. came out. Uh, no, I'm thinking of his Watchmen. Oh, yeah, HBO, yeah, yeah. You know, came out, was it 40 years after we, we no, it can't be 40, it's a good 30 years, you know, and he's kept his dreams fueled by Watchmen Alive for all that time. I'm, I'm always a bit wary of something being called the best of all time, uh, you know. Me too. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, I mean, I appreciate the sentiment, um, but um, it, it does sometimes feel a bit weird. But again, hey, if people are going to say it's great and we're geniuses, who's going to tell them to stop, you know? Um, of course, like, you know, the last thing I'll say about it is that there are a lot of mysteries in Watchmen, but I feel because of the echoes and the, the, the nine panel grid and everything, they, every time I reread Watchmen, I'm like, this should have been obvious from the start, like, uh, <laughs> Walter Kovach being Rorschach, you literally do the same shot of Walter 
uh, holding the sign, and then the next shot is literally Rorschach from that yep. same angle. And no one <laughs> picked up on it. Everybody that I lend this to is still like, oh my God, he's that guy. I'm like, I know. Well, like, you're always kind of w w walking that line of obscurity and subtlety, you know, that, that if you're too good at disguising it, nobody notices it. But if you're not good enough, it, it seems obvious. So that was, and there were lots of things where it actually came down to quite fine judgment. I mean, if you think about, I mean, something that we did with Watchmen, we had full frontal male nudity yeah. in a mainstream comic book, which was unthinkable. But we chose our moment, the panel in which you see Dr. Manhattan fully frontally naked. It hasn't got a sexual connotation at all. Whereas a couple of pages before, he's in bed with his girlfriend and it would have had a completely different effect. So there's things that we did that almost felt were deliberately under people's right radar that they'd actually see him naked and then they'd read it for a bit and think, hold on a minute, this guy's not, not got any, any pants on, what's going on? And, and to play those kind of tricks on people. Funnily enough, I, I was doing a, um, a, a YouTube thing the other day with Kayfabe, you know, Ed Piscor yeah. and Jim Rugg, who, I mean, you've, you've got a great channel here. They've got a brilliant channel as well. Um, and oh, they're the they standard. Be, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and, and they, like you, encourage sort of a rather longer form digression. But they got me to go through the final issue of Watchmen with them because they've been going through it issue by issue. And I, I saw something that I completely forgot I drew, that I looked at at first and thought, what's that? And then, ah, I get it. I've never seen that since the day I drew it. It's the scene after Rorschach has been vaporized by Dr. Manhattan. And there's this scene where there's the kind of the, the pink snow where Rorschach's blood has been scattered and, and absorbed into it. And there's kind of pink, vapor coming off from it and there's his hat lying there because his hat blew off in the wind just before manhattan zapped it but also there's like a circular thing with a circular blob in it and i thought my god i know what that is that's rorschach's mask and it's not being vaporized and when it's when there's nothing happening behind it it just pulls into a circle of black and i thought of even about myself that's really good dave but i I had, I've looked at Watchmen, obviously, loads, but I've never seen that before. So even now, all those years afterwards, I'm seeing things that I didn't even see. There's, the, 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 there's another example as well, where in issue one, we show Dan and Laurie in a sort of swanky restaurant. And in this restaurant are a few sort of characters. And there are a couple of older gentlemen sitting at a table holding hands, clearly um, a gay couple because we wanted to show that the sexual mores of the Watchmen world were slightly different than, than ours. And what would have perhaps been a problem in our world wasn't a problem in the Watchmen world. And somebody said, hey, I know who those couple of people were. That is Captain Metropolis and Hoodie Justice, who never actually died, but you know, just covered their trail, went away, and are now living together in obscurity as gay lovers and i thought that was never our intention we never had that in mind but it's such a good theory that i'm almost inclined to say yep you got it we wonder when somebody was go was going to realize that so you know but, absolutely but I, think, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I, but I think when a thing is as complex and it's got so much detail in it as as watchmen it's a bit like i was saying people joining up the dots in stories you know if you if you've got a thing you can see patterns where, where there aren't any sometimes or see the see the wrong pattern um and i think there is so much in watchmen that it's almost inevitable that people will find things and and for the first time and it will be meaningful or will find things and it actually will be completely um unintentional so uh yeah so even me even me on my my latest rereading of watchmen found things that i'd never seen before I, I know that one of the things about it too is, um, you know, as a as a reader, because I think I might have read how to draw comics the Marvel way, like a couple of years before it, and I'm yeah. like, the way that you guys did it is, I don't want to I don't want to call it the anti Kirby comic, but it does feel like you're walking away from the conventions that were laid out by 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 the King, um, you know, everything is more subtle. 
more quiet, even just breaking somebody's finger instead of bam, you know? Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, you can have the style of comics where it's extreme physical action punctuated by quiet moments. And that's quite interesting. Or you can have a thing that's quiet, but then punctuated by extreme violence, like what, like Rorschach breaking somebody's finger in a Kirby superhero comic, that would have had no significance at all. But in context of what we were doing, it did. You know, what we were trying to do with Watchmen was do a superhero comic that wasn't done in the way that superhero comics were traditionally done. So obviously Kirby is the king, the great innovator, the the presiding genius over the world of action suits superheroes. Whereas artists and writers like Ditko, Harvey Kurtzman, Will Eisner, who we lent on for Watchmen, aren't initially associated with the superhero comic. So to do a hero comic, but in their vernacular, in their language, uh, gives it a twist in the same way that me and John Higgins decided to colour it not in the normal palette of yeah. American superhero comics. It's like, this is a comic, these are costumed heroes, but it doesn't on any level feel like the ones that we're used to seeing. So I would say not so much that we were anti-Kirby, but Kirby, that wasn't Kirby's universe, but it was an, an adjoining universe to Ditko, Kurtzman and Eisner. I think that's probably how I describe it. I feel like it'll surprise some readers to hear Kurtzman in there, but it's all of the, it's the density of information and the. Yeah. And also the thing, all the tricks that I say tricks that, that makes it sound a bit superficial, but all the effects he would do, like having a fit, a character in a fixed position and the background changing or the background remaining the same and the character walking through it, which was the thing that, that, that Eisner would do as well. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, they they were our storytelling gods on this one. And, um, you know, um, I think that was uh, that was another thing that even on a subliminal level, I mean, when I mention those people, everybody immediately sees it. But I think on a subliminal level, it just feels different and un yeah. unusual. Speaking of the late, great Will Eisner, you and Alan relaunched The Spirit, The New Adventures. You did that first issue with them. Yeah. What was that like? What was, that, what was it like working on the spirit? Well, that was a dream come true. I mean, again, I can remember the first spirit comic I saw, which was one of the reprints that, um, what was the name of the character, the company? It, it wasn't IDW, there were much later publishers, but there was some, there was a publisher who in the sort of early 60s, I think, got hold of the printing plates to some old quality comics and they did like a couple of pirated issues of, the spirit wasn't it can... warren no no it wasn't warren it was it was before warren and one of these stories i can remember was was called it was the spirit story called the last trolley bus which mm -hmm. is still my favorite spirit story and i saw that and again i'd never seen anything like it before it was this sort of semi semi cartoony full of atmosphere haunting kind of story um, so Eisner's work has always felt magical to me. And I was so thrilled when they brought out the, the DC archives, you know, and, and, it, and I, those have got pride of place on my, on my shelf over there to have all those spirit stories, which were originally published in weekly Sunday newspaper supplements, but had never in their entirety been reprinted before. That was just so thrilling. Um, and when I, when Kitchen Sink, as I believe it was, got yeah. the right to do new adventures of the spirit, they've been trying to get Eisner to agree to it for a long time. And he was very reluctant. And he was obviously the spirit was his baby. It was very precious to him. But anyway, Dennis Kitchen eventually talked him into doing it and put forward Alan and I as possible candidates to draw it, or in fact, to draw the first issue. Um, I, Eisner was very concerned. I mean, by this time, I'd got to know him a bit and Alan had got to know him a bit as well. And Well, I mean, I could... Uh, let me backtrack a bit. I mean, I know you encourage long-form programming, but let's not try and get to... I first met Eisner in England. He, he'd come over to talk 
to do various bits of business, probably perhaps just to visit England. But he ended up at a meeting of a, of a thing called the Society of Strip Illustration, where us comic book, comic strip artists used to take over a pub for the evening and have talks about comics and compare notes and have a good old gossip, you know. And Eisner came along to that. And I arrived early for this meeting because I definitely wanted to hear Eisner speak. And he was sitting in the pub on his own having a quiet drink. And I thought, I'm, I'm really embarrassed to do this because I don't want to make a nuisance of myself. But I just want to say hello to him while I've got the chance. So I went over and introduced myself and said how much his work meant to me and what a pleasure it was to meet him. And he said, oh, are you a comic artist? I said, yeah, and I had a big portfolio, basically. Oh, can, can I see your stuff? I said, well, if you really want to. He said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see it. So he then went through my portfolio and critiqued what I had in, in, in my bag in a really uh, very um, no-holds-barred way, but in a kind way and in a constructive way. Gave me some really good ideas, gave me some really good analysis of what I was doing, what I could maybe do, do a bit differently. And gave me, it was over half an hour of his time, which was incredibly generous. The next time I met him, he was in England again with his wife, Anne, for a comic convention. And by that time, Watchman was out. So Willard was congratulating me and saying how wonderful Alan and I were, you know. So it's from wannabe to, hey, you guys are really good, which is great. And then I had another couple of meetings with him and I got on personally got on really well with with Will um, and I even got to give the keynote speech at the San Diego Comic Con one year where I sort of praised him so it's nice to say publicly how, how much he meant to me but I remember I think it was at that same show San Diego show that by that time he had given his permission that there could be new versions of the spirit and he took me to one side we went and had a coffee together and he, he made me promise him one thing, and that is that Alan and I would not make the spirit a junkie. That we <laughs> show him a, a drugs problem. And I said, Will, nothing could be further from our thoughts. That's definitely not the way we would treat, treat the spirit. So once he was reassured about that, and, and Alan wrote three fantastic stories that kind of retold the spirit's origin, and I got the chance to draw him. And again, you know, like I was saying with, Watchman, you know, the, pr the pressure was on to make it really good because you didn't want to let anybody down. We didn't want to let Will down at all. So we put so much trouble and care and effort and time into it. And I'm really, I'm really proud that we did. And I'm really very happy with the way the stories turn out. Again, a bit like I was saying with Superman earlier, we got our chance to do our one take, or in my case, our one take at, soup, at the spirit and do something that was very well received that summed up everything we felt about the character and then just walked away. And then the thing that was so good was um, Kitchen Sink, or I believe Dark Horse, actually then put all these new adventures of the spirit drawn by Alan and me and various other writers and artists, put them into a, a collected archive edition that exactly matched the trade dress of the DC archives. So, and numbered it so it fitted in after Eisner's work. So to be connected with Will Eisner and have a, a, a lovely book on the shelf to prove it as well is really a dream come true. Um, and I feel very privileged to have met Will because he was, we talked about Kirby being the king of superhero comics. Will, Will Eisner was such a groundbreaker, such an innovator. What, you know, one of the grand old men of comics by the time I met him anyway, I'm one of the grand old men of comics now. Um, but um, yeah, it, it was it was like a dream come true. And he sent me a note saying that he was so happy with what Alan and I had done. So yeah, that was that was really good. And it was the first thing Alan and I had done together since Watchmen and probably one of the last things we've done since Watchmen. I know that at the time you were also talking about uh, a possible project that you two were going to do together on a CD-ROM. I don't know if you remember this. I do, yeah. Yeah, it seemed like computer games or some sort of interactive version of comics or stories could be the thing. And we talked about it a bit and I spent a weekend with Alan and we went through it all and I showed him some stuff on the computer and we came up with a sort of a general way it might work. But to be honest, we didn't know enough about the field and we probably would have had to hand it over to somebody else to develop. You know, again, I was kind of saying years ago, whenever we began this interview, that 
you could do comics with a piece of paper and a pencil. You can't do computer games like that. You know, you've got to have a studio full of people, really, if it's going to going to look any good. Uh, and we realised that we couldn't do that. And yeah, that didn't really go anywhere. Again, preparing for my autobiography, I dug up loads of notes about it, and it was it was based on um, the Kabbalah, you know, the Tree of Life, and using that as a matrix or a template for a branching adventure. I mean, it would have been re re really interesting. And my my mind recoils from what the complexity of it could have been like. How, you know, n knowing what the complexity of Watchmen is, or From Hell, or, or something like that. I think we we would have both gone mad by the time we finished doing it. But yeah, it was never to be. I believe the last thing that you did with Alan was uh, you did a backup story in Tom Strong. Oh, I did, didn't I? Yeah. Yes. Which I I love all those uh, America's Best comics that Alan did, and and again they all display his understanding of comics and what makes it for great characters. And yeah, I mean that was just a little snippet that I didn't even letter myself. It's one of our lesser works. I I did also. This wasn't strictly a, a collaboration with Alan, but I did write a story for uh, America's Best Comics. It was a a grey shirt story that Rick yeah. Veach drew. Uh, and I really enjoyed doing that. I tried to bring some of the complexities to that that Alan brings to his writing, where it's a convoluted thing about a joke being passed on and then it coming back to bite the guy in the ass, you know? Um, so, yeah, that, that was... That was really like, funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know that you and, uh, you and Bill Sienkiewicz um, switched dance partners after Watchmen and after Electra Assassin. And I feel like you and Alan, uh, you know, that made logical sense because you're both so structured and so, mm. yeah. And Bill and Frank uh, made logical sense. Was that, um, and of, of course we know what happened with, with Alan and Bill, but uh, was that, was there a learning curve with Frank coming from, coming from Alan, knowing that he was more like Mozart, uh, not Mozart, um, Miles, Davis. Miles Davis. Yeah, I mean, I I love variety. I mean, Alan's scripts are famous for their verbosity and the, and the, the amount of detail. Some of it undrawable, some of it he doesn't even really expect you to draw. You know, so there is a lot to assimilate there, whereas Frank's stuff is much more terse. Sometimes he will describe things in more detail. And I, I like the variety. I wouldn't say... I only like to work on really detailed scripts, or I only like to work Marvel style. I don't generally like working purely Marvel style because I think it's a bit approximate. I think it works as a commercial thing and good work has been done, but it's a little bit too unstructured and a little bit too, I, I always feel that I want to know who's in charge at, at any given point of the game. And in the Marvel method, which is basically drawing from a plot, it, it loses a lot of the nuance and the subtlety, I think. But anyway, um, I didn't find it at all difficult to start working with Frank in that slightly more free form. In fact, after the discipline of Watchmen, I sort of actively enjoyed it to, to have a different dance partner, you know? Um, and I think Bill wasn't so lucky because the strength of Bill's work, again, is that kind of jazz-like improvisation, no no holds, do what feels right in the moment, mixed media, you know, just kind of a much less predictable way of drawing. And I think that whereas to me, Alan gave me a scaffolding that I could build out on, I think with Bill, it must have felt more like a prison. And, and I, I don't think it was a very good experience for Bill because obviously Bill holds Alan in tremendous regard, but I think on some level, Bill must have realized that it, it, it wasn't working. And I remember having, it's a long, long time ago, and it was a very drunken occasion at a San Diego Comic-Con trying to console Bill, you know, because Bill thought he'd really failed and he'd let Alan down. And that wasn't really it. It was more that he didn't feel he was the right man to do it justice, that what Alan was doing was so good and complete that he knew that he couldn't do it, you know. Um, and... Um, and then it got passed on to Al Columbia, I believe, who was an assistant of Bill's at one time. Um, but then, as you know, it never got further than two published issues. It was hugely complex. I think it would make Watchmen look simplistic if you were to 
see what big numbers could have been like if it had but, finished yeah but sometimes you know these things look look a great idea look a good combination but they've proved not to be but i think yeah i i felt really sorry for bill because bill is a, is a great guy and a hell of an artist and i just think he realized he signed on for something that really wasn't going to work what was the fan reaction like to something like Martha Washington goes to war and it's a, you know, it's a black woman g- going to war named Martha Washington uh, yeah. in the eighties. Yeah. Well, I mean, I really love the idea of, you know, obviously as far as the fans are concerned or as far as money is concerned, what Frank and I should have done is a, a hard hitting grim and gritty story about retired superheroes because he just made a fortune off that. And, you know, not just in a financial sense, but, you know, in a reputational sense from Dark Knight, which was essentially Batman retires. And I'd done the same on Watchmen with all the retired and dysfunctional heroes there. We could have cleaned up if we'd done a comic like that. It would have been more of the same. You think fans just want you guys to continue doing the same things? Well, that, well, that's right. You know, and, and I mean, even the, comic book publishers thought hey this is what we've got to do grim and gritty you know all all the heroes that you thought were good are all psychos which is a possible approach but anyway what when frank and i decided we wanted to do something together uh, which happened in the way these things always do you know you're having a few drinks or you're at a convention you go hey you know i really love your work wouldn't it be great to do something together and you go yeah that'd be brilliant and that's more or less what what frank and i did um and Frank has got a great understanding of what makes a hero. Well, I like to think maybe I have as well, but, but Frank's understanding is that anybody can be a hero. And being a hero doesn't mean you've got to be a six foot four muscle bound white man. I mean, that's what happens in superhero comics. So what we went for was, was diametrically opposite for that. We thought, let's have somebody who's just a decent human being, who's not physically imposing, who's come from a really disadvantaged background and is going to make her way, and it has to be her way in the world. Because, you know, if you were, at that time, if you were talking about, and now to a great degree, talking about disadvantaged people, you, you were talking about black people, you're talking about women, you're talking about people who lived in, in poor housing con- conditions. And that was what Martha was. She was a young black woman from the ghetto of Chicago who found herself in a mad world and was just trying to get through it as best she could to stay alive and be a decent people and make her mother happy. That was what she was doing, which is a great heroic character. And from the, reading the very first notes that Frank had, I thought, this is a great thing. This, this is great. This isn't something I probably would never have thought, of, but she's got everything you want in a hero. And it was weird of all the characters I've drawn Martha is the one that I feel closest to. I think maybe because Frank and I told her story over many, many pages, twice as many pages as Watchmen. And over many, many years, it was what we come back to in between doing, doing other things. I really feel I know the character. And when Frank wrote the final Martha, which I won't spoil by telling you what happens, it brought a tear to my eye because I knew I'd never be seeing her again or never be drawing her again. And it just felt it just felt right, you know, it, and, and um, she, she's, I, I, I don't know, she's unlike any other heroic character I've done, but she's the greatest hero of them all, I think. Um, speaking of the greatest hero of them all, you worked with Mark Wade to combine two of the greatest heroes of them all. What was it like working on the Amalgam book, Super Soldier? Because those look so oh, fun. Well. Yeah, well, I mean, to a, to a comics fan, which is what I essentially, um, you know, the chance to do that is just imagine, you know, kind of Superman and Captain America melt melded together. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it only took me a heartbeat to say yes to that. And Mark, of course, is a huge comics fan as well. So, you know, he was on that kind of comic fan high. And it kind of works, I think, that costume and the story we came up with was sort of merging the Red Skull and Luthor and Nazi robots and it, 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 it just it just felt right. I mean, on the second one, that was done under slightly different circumstances and I co-plotted 
I think I wrote the script. I think Mark and yeah. I co-plotted that and I penciled it and Jimmy Palmiotti inked it all under a bit of pressure. We were all having to work quite quickly on that. I was never quite as happy with, with, with that one. But yeah, that was like a, like a kind of fanboy dream comes true, definitely. The lunatics have taken over the asylum. And it was, you know, it was... And, and I got to draw a couple of wraparound covers that had all these mangled up kind of characters on, on them as well. You know, some, sometimes you, you can do something like Watchmen and it's kind of, it's the most wonderful comic book ever done. And sometimes you just do something and it's just fun. It's just a, just a bit, Watchmen was fun, but it, sometimes you do something whose only reason for existing is to have fun. The only point you're trying to make is, hey, isn't this cool? Wouldn't it be brilliant if you got these two and mushed them together, you know? Can I tell you what Mark Wade told me about that book? Sure. He said, if I'm remembering it right, I wrote it to prove to Dave Gibbons that I was good. <laughs> yeah, he's always trying to prove to me he's good. He's quite good. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, Mark's somebody I've, I've, I've spent a few, a few times with over, over this. He's a brilliant and innovative writer, and he's a great thinker, he, and he understands, and a bit like I was saying about Alan, he knows what makes comics tick. Um, and he's a great spokesman for the for the medium as, as well. So it was, it was a real pleasure to get a chance to work with him. And he understands character, right? Like character work and character building, I, th I feel like is his biggest strength. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, actually, is, isn't it? I mean, there are these two approaches to stories. You either go plot driven or character driven. And I, I'm sort of, I tend to work in a plot driven kind. I'm more of a structure guy, but Mark, yeah, M M Mark's way through it is to come up with the characters and their motivations and let the characters find the story. Um, and yeah, yeah, no, he, he, he did prove to me that he, he didn't have to prove to me he was good. I knew that, that already, but uh, if that was the motivation, I'm just glad we got to work together. I feel like Alan Moore is not the most famous writer you've ever worked with. I feel like that honor belongs to the man, Stan Lee. I'll stand, yeah. Yeah. Was yes, I, I helped Stan a lot during his career. <laughs> did did you uh so you were you know he came over to DC, did the Just Imagine series? There's a lot yeah. of rumors about that, about how much of it was actually him and how much of it was editorial interference. Uh I don't know if that held true for the Green Lantern one that you guys did, but yeah, what well, was that like? Um, well, I mean, it almost wasn't the first thing that Stan and I worked on on to, together. I mean, I I I, I, mean, I obviously knew who he was from when I was a kid, but I, I actually met him when he came over to the UK um, to publicise some Marvel book. And we both ended up on a kids TV programme and we had lunch and had a chat and he loves Watchmen and I love the stuff that he co-created at Marvel. And I actually showed him the postcard that I got when I wrote a fan, the one and only fan letter I ever wrote to Marvel. And I got a blue postcard back that was signed from Stan and the gang. And even when I showed it to him, I knew that he didn't write it. It was actually Flo Steinberg. But he knew, he could see that I was a died in the wall Marvel fan. And again, we had the conversation, hey, wouldn't it be great to, to do something to, together? And I thought about it and I thought, you know what I'd like to do is do Captain America Year Zero, because the very first thing that Stan ever wrote that appeared in print was a text story in, I believe, Captain America number three. Yeah. And I thought, if I could turn that into a story, you know, a longer, more elaborate story, maybe Stan and I could do that together. So I sort of pitched the idea to Stan. He said, yeah, great, except you, you plot it, you, you come up with the whole story you draw it and ink it and I'll dialogue it. And I thought, well, that's okay, yeah. So I put together this story and I still have to think it was really a pretty good story, but I couldn't get much traction at Marvel uh, and Stan liked it, but he thought he needed some work on it. So that kind of didn't go anywhere. Although I, I plotted the whole thing out, I thumbnailed the whole thing. I've got all the little miniature comic book pages of how Captain America became Captain America and a bit a bit of his childhood and blah, blah. I, I still rate it as a, as a story. Those fools up at Marvel, they, they don't know what they know. They don't know what they let get away. I think they probably do. But um, 
so, so, so um, um, anyway, years later, um, Mike Carlin phoned me up and said they're going to do this thing where they got Stan on board uh, and to see what would happen if he recreated the characters of the DC universe. And would I want to do Green Lantern with it? And I said, yes, just, you know, even as Mark, Mike was still speaking, yes, because you know, it was my chance as a fanboy to tick someone else off. You know, I, t I could tick off Superman, Spirit, Will Eisner. I even worked with Harvey Kurtzman, Harvey Kurtzman. Stan you Lee. Did? Yeah, I, I did it. I'll, I'll come to that next. Okay. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so Stan and I, Stan had a r rough idea of this, the sort of rough shape of this, um green lantern story and um you know mike had encouraged me to write for dc i did a world's finest that mike edited so he yeah. knew that i could write so m me and mike knocked the story around a bit and then sent stan the fully drawn thing um and he had some input in, into the story it wasn't just he did whatever we said but we it's true i would have to say did the main body of the work, although a lot of the conception was stand. Um, and then he wrote the final dialogue and then Dick Giordano actually inked my pencil. So it was a slightly hybrid thing. But yeah, it was really just from the point of view, like we said about the amalgam characters, just a really cool fanboy thing to do. Hey, you, you managed to work with Stan Lee. Uh, I was going to go back to Harvey Kurtzman. Yeah, I feel like I completely glossed over this. Yeah, we... Um, we went to a convention, a whole load of us Brits went to, and, and Americans as well, went to a convention in Grenoble in France. There's a huge convention in France at Angoulême, which is a wonderful sort of cultural celebration of comics. Uh, and they get all sorts of people there. It's a huge convention. But the people at Grenoble in the French Alps, they wanted to do their own comic show. So they threw money at it to try and get the word around amongst creators. So I was there, Alan was there. Harvey Kurtzman was there, Will Eisner was there, Bill Sienkiewicz was there, Brian Bolland was there, um, David Mazzicelli was there, Ed, the, Sergio Aragonis. It was like a kind of who's who of international comics. And um, Kurtzman actually sought me out and congratulated me on Watchmen. And he was amazed at all the, all the, the, the work in it. And he said, would you ever be interested in doing something with me? I said, you know, your work meant so much to me in Mad Magazine and everything. I'd, I'd be great to have the chance to do something. So he was working on this book for Byron Price Publishing, and it's called Harvey Kurtzman's Strange Adventures. And it was it was kind of a redo of the sort of stuff that he used to do in Mad Comic. And so there was me and there was Bill Stout, and I can't remember the other people. We basically did um, like a mad comic version of a character and I did a spoof of the Silver Surfer called Super Surfer and we worked in the way that he used to work with his uh, mad artist where he actually sent the script and layouts of every single page and notes and I then drew it out in pencil and sent it back to him and he was a really hard taskmaster but yeah we ended up doing this I think it's like a six or eight page story called the Super Surfer. Um, it hasn't been very widely seen. Again, I go into this story in rather more detail in my autobiography, which is, I think I mentioned before, it's coming out in October of 2022. Um, and there's some I can't wait. From... I can't wait. Sorry? Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. Good, good. That, this is the feeling I'm trying to instill in people. I can't wait. I want the full story. And, uh, and I did the whole thing, pencil inked it, lettered it, coloured it, and... Yeah, it, it was my chance to work with, with, with Harvey. So another one ticked off the list. I feel like, um, you know, Green Lantern is, it's a weird thing because you have one of the longest tenures ever on Green Lantern, like when you put all of your stuff together. But I feel like it's not with Hal Jordan. Like a lot of the Green Lantern stuff you're known for, like you, you made Jon Stewart the, the, the prominent Green Lantern in the in the 80s. You know, there's the Just Imagine stuff with, with Stan. There's a the Green Lantern mm -hmm. core. Uh, so is it, so what is it that draws you back to the Green Lantern mythos? Yeah, I mean, I would have to be be honest. Again, I'm sorry to keep harping on, but, but there's three different entries about Green Lantern in my autobiography because it, he is a character that I've come back to, just like with Dan Dare in England, I seem to keep 
keep coming back to him. But I must say, growing up, I, I liked Green Lantern. I preferred The Flash. Um, I think mainly because I like Carmen Infantino's artwork. So I was kind of familiar with the idea of Green Lantern. And I loved the idea of the sort of interstellar space force. That, that was the aspect of it that, that I liked the best. So when I finally came to work for DC Comics, the first thing they offered me were Green Lantern core backups in Green Lantern, which perfectly suited me. Because as we were saying before, they were very like the sort of short stories that I was used to doing in English comics. Every issue, it was something different, a different character, a different design, a different kind of story. So I really loved doing those Green Lantern core stories. And then DC were so pleased with, with what I'd done with those that they offered me the lead story in the book. And of course I was thrilled because this is me drawing Green Lantern in a monthly comic book. Again, you know, on the fanboy level, it's yes, I am a genuine DC artist, you know. I'm working on this just like Gil Kane worked on it or like Infantino or Sikowski or whatever would work on the rest of the comic books I love. So this is me, I've actually made it. I am working for DC Comics as a line, uh, uh, you know, comic line artist doing a monthly book. But then what happened was the stories, which were very well written by Len Wee, Len seemed to be more interested in, or the market was more interested in, more kind of soap opera kind of stories where it was about Hal Jordan and his struggles with his girlfriend, um, you know, Carol Ferris and what it meant to meet people from his past. And, and it wasn't, I, I, it, it would really come alive for me when he went to Oa and I could draw the Guardians and I could draw Tomar Ray and I could draw the rest of his Green Lantern, Arisia and the rest. I can remember all these names, isn't it weird? As I get older, I've forgotten so much stuff, but I can remember the, <laughs> the Green Lantern course, I don't want to say something. Um, so um, I really loved doing those bits and I sort of was running out of steam on Hal Jordan because he wasn't my favourite Green Lantern, yeah. really. Uh, John Who is Stewart, your favourite? Is it John? Uh, he, he's really good. And funny enough, I did an interview the other day with somebody from Warner Brothers about John Stewart. I, yeah, I did. I really like the idea of, of John Stewart. And that kind of grew out of the whole kind of revitalization of Green Lantern that happened with when Neil Adams and Danny O'Neill were working on it, when they tried to make it much more in tune with the real world rather than the sort of DC never changes world. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I did like, I, it was the, the, the alien Green Lanterns I kind of really liked. You know, I, I'd like to draw somebody who's like a superhero character, but he's got a parrot head. You know, that's, I find that quite en entertaining. Um, so, yeah, so it was really, as I say, really the Green Lantern core that probably got my juices going more than more than Hal Jordan. And of course, as you, as you kind of mentioned, I went on later to actually write the Green Lantern core, which again, I enjoyed because it was my chance to be John Broom or Gardner Fox or one of those DC line writers and write a monthly comic book and see what that felt like. So that was another fanboy tick off, you know. With an ensemble. Such, such a big cast well yeah is evan dorkin insane because he had you draw a yes. green lantern getting killed by a giant banana <laughs> well again how can you i mean evan's such a such a funny guy I, I love the stuff he's done i love that book called beasts of burden that, that, that he did for dark horse but but no it, i didn't take much talking into that and again mike carlin was the the editor of it and it was my chance to really get my Silver Age of Comics kicks to try and do as close to a 1960s world's finest comic as I could. And yeah, he wrote in all, all sorts of really interesting artists for that. So yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm a serious graphic novelist, but I'm always up for a laugh. I feel like that was one of the last things that you did um, art-wise for DC, because I feel like you've been, you've been doing a lot more writing since then. And yeah. I, I really feel like it brings your art career full circle at DC because one of the first things that you did was Brave and the Bold number 200, where you were doing a throwback style to Dick Sprang too. So it's like, yeah. and then this one, you were doing a throwback style to, to somebody like Kurt Swan. I thought yeah, that was very I mean, cool. It's, it's a bit, it's, it's funny that it's a bit like getting pigeonholed because it's like, you know, you go from being the, 
one, one of the young Turks, like I was on, say, 2000 AD, or the, or the stuff that Alan and I did for DC. And then you become the guy, if they want something drawn, drawn in an old-fashioned way, they get to do it. You know, there's a slight bit of sweetness about, about that. And ob obviously, it's very emotive for me, that kind of style. And when I was a kid, I, you know, I, the comics I did were pastiches of sort of DC comics anyway. But it's really where the last few things I did, I did do a Superman cover. I think it was for Action... 1000. 1000. And I did a, a really weird sort of Silver Age feel thing for that. But yeah. I have to tell you, I think the truth is, I'm not saying that I'll never draw anything ever again, but I really have done a lot of drawing over my career. And there's something at the moment about writing which sort of appeals to me more. Maybe it's because you can get more over in less time, that you can, you know, explore things more. There's something about the time consuming nature of sitting down and drawing, which I still love to do it and I can still escape into doing it, but it's less immediately attractive to me. And also, I have to tell you, I look around at the artists that there are in comics nowadays, and I think, God, if I was trying to break into comics now, it'd be kind of tough. So there are I, more I tools. Kind of, there are more tools at their disposal, though, right? Yeah, and there's and there's more money and there's the internet and there's infinite reference on the internet whereas in my day we had to make it all up from our head we didn't have photographs that help us so yeah so my drawing output has kind of gone down which i think is a function of having done so much drawing and feeling that maybe i could do do some more writing i mean i did i mention my autobiography that i've been working on i think maybe i did just in passing but i really enjoyed writing that you know to write with my voice in a descriptive way about things that had happened because it's you and your viewers, if they're still here after, after these hours. You're Dave the Gibbons, they're absolutely listening. <laughs> but, you know, I am a man of words as much as I'm a man of pictures. And um, I do like writing, I do enjoy writing. And I think there are more challenges there for me at the moment. The thing, the drawing I do really enjoy is, is life drawing. Um, I haven't, I hadn't over the years done as much of that as I would like to. One of the things about being kind of semi-retired is that you have a bit more free time. And I, there are some really good live art, you know, life drawing classes locally. Um, and I do love to just sit and draw for the love of drawing, not to sell it to somebody or to get paid or for the fans to pick over, but just to sit and draw something for the enjoyment and the intellectual exercise of looking at something it sounds um, wonderful yeah yeah so i do enjoy drawing that and, and and also i mean i actually really like some of the drawings i've done but i probably would never show them to anybody because the minute you're showing them you're back in the old routine you're not doing them for you you're doing them for someone else perhaps perhaps one day when things get really hard it'll be the unseen art of dave gibbons you know life life drawings at the foot of the master or something like that it's like know? insurance as an insurance policy so yeah yeah i guess well, and, and 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 i mean you, you know if i was to rub the faces out and draw a blot on them i could they could be <laughs> i could draw, draw an s on their chest or probably just color them all in blue because they're mostly naked and they could be like <laughs> dr manhattan you know i feel like one of the things that you love about writing for other people is that you get to work with other artists now i i get i hear a lot from artists that the the hardest types of writers to draw for is a writer who also knows how to draw because you can't fake it. <laughs> is that? Like, That's kind of true. But, but the other thing is, as a point of honor, I would never ask anybody to draw something that I couldn't draw. And I think also if you do draw yourself, I mean, I think the very best writers of comics have got a good visual sense. I mean, Mark Wade, we mentioned, he's got a really good visual sense. Alan's got an amazing visual sense and he, he, again, he can analyze what, what an artist's strengths are or what an artist likes to draw, or not necessarily what an artist likes to draw, but could be persuaded into drawing, you know? Because sometimes we don't know what we're capable of until we are a bit challenged. So, yeah, I mean, I am, um, I find that the, I feel quite ha happy. If, if I can visualize something, I know the artist can draw it. I mean, there's famous stories of people being asked to draw impossible things. I mean. Alan has asked me to draw things that are frankly impossible, although 
asking me to draw them kind of helps put my head in the right place. For instance, he once said, I think it was the scenes in Watchmen where we were with Sally Jupiter in her retirement home. He had a description that said, in the background, we can see the dust motes dancing in the slanting afternoon light. And I know exactly what he means. We've all sat in a room and the sunlight's coming in and there's bits of dust and it's, it's quite magical. You couldn't draw, you just couldn't draw that, you know, but at least it set, set the mood for me. So, and sometimes when you're writing something for an artist to draw, it's very tempting to think, I can't be bothered to write all this description. I'll just draw a little picture of what it's going to look like. But if you do that, that's even worse. The minute, and it's some some writers have done that to me. And the minute you've seen that horrible, scrappy, scribbly little sketch, you can't unsee it, and it becomes your point of departure, and you you feel tied to it that you've got to somehow follow it. So yeah, I I, I would like to think that the artists who work with me, and I've been really lucky. I mean, Mike Mike Mignola, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, Steve Rude. I mean, I've had some incredible. Um, artists. Um, I was going to say, I've, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I feel I've given them stuff to draw that uh, is worth drawing. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, uh, would you mind if I gave you some names and you, you told me what you, what you thought of their art while you were doing it? If you, if you learned anything from, from, from I'm it? sure the answer is yes, yes to all those. Yeah, go on then. Right, I'm going to start with. A man who I swear every time he posts anything on Facebook, every artist that I'm connected to likes his posts. Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. You're starting at the top. I mean, he is just, he's one of these people who's so good that you don't notice how good he is. It, it is the art that conceals itself. I've worked with him on a couple of things. He drew a, a Superman Elseworlds story that I wrote called Cal, yeah. uh, as in Cal L, um, which was a medieval Superman. And it was just amazing that the authenticity of the way he drew the Middle Ages, the heroism of Superman, the beauty of the princess was just incredible. And what was really wonderful about it was the editor was my friend, Mike Carlin, and Mike sent me Xeroxes of his full size, of, of Jose's full size pencils and his full size ink, so I was able to study them. And he cannot, he cannot draw a bad line, that guy. He's very self-critical, like a lot of us artists are, but he was just absolutely superb. So I learned a lot from that. And he, he also, as, as I, I said somewhere, that he drew it exactly the way I would have drawn it if I could draw as well as him. So that was great. The second time that I worked with him, was uh, DC did a series called Legacies written by yeah. Len Wein. And it was kind of the story of the DC universe. And again, Mike Carlin phoned me up and said, well, I, did I want to do a backup story for an issue of that? And I said, yeah, you know, who's doing the lead story? And he said, oh, it's Garcia Lopez. I said, oh, wow. I'm going to have to be on my best behavior to look good next to him. I said, who's, who's inking him? And Mike said, uh, well, we haven't got anybody really. I said, can I ink him? He said, that would be brilliant if you had the time. So I got to ink Jose's work. And I tell you, it's intimidating because he draws it to just the right degree. Everything is there, but it's not the final line, but it's close to the final line. But as an inker, there's enough left to keep you interested and also terrified because you don't want to screw it up. Yeah. And he actually sent me an email after I'd done it to thank me for making him look good which is a measure of the man's modesty. So yeah, I've got the greatest regard for him. Yeah, so you have worked with him both as a writer and as an inker. Um, yeah. And funny thing about that DC Legacies issue is you finally got to do your Challenger story. I did, I did. I mean, it pales in comparison to what Jose did in the lead story, but yeah, I did finally get to draw those challenges. What about Ryan Sook for Wednesday Comics? Come on, D. Yeah. Again, I mean, I've, I've been so lucky because he illustrated the, the, a commandy story that I wrote that I kind of wrote and visualised in the style of Hal Foster's Prince Valiant, you know, that classic, epic kind of historical feel. Um, and it was, it was quite a challenging thing because it was like a 12-panel page, a big tabloid page. 
Um, and they suggested Ryan Sook as the artist. And I thought, oh, he'd be great because he's got that epic feel, wonderful draftsman. And he absolutely sold it, you know, the sort of talking animals and the sense of grandeur and the mythic sort of ambience of it. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I couldn't imagine anybody doing it better. That's my favorite of the Wednesday comics for the record. It's oh, just good. writing wise and art wise. I feel like it's a complete and total package yeah, and I, exactly what it. you'd expect from a, from a Wednesday, from a Sunday comic, actually. Yeah, good one. Well, no. And, and, and of course that, that was part of my approach to it because those traditional Sunday adventure comics, Prince Valley and uh, Flash Gordon, they didn't actually use word balloons. They used captions or blocks of, 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 di of dialogue rather than things in balloons. So even then, you know, we were talking earlier about designing the artwork. I, I went as far with the artwork as designing that that's how it's going to look. Because even before anything's drawn, that immediately puts you back with Prince Valiant and Flash Gordon. So, yeah, it was good. And, to, and for Ryan to draw it in that format, uh, you know, was, was just brilliant. Yeah, so that was... That was a good experience. What about Steve Rude? Steve is just great. I mean, he is a one-off, Steve, and I just admire his passion for comics. He has got this huge passion for comics. He puts his heart and soul into it. He's, he's one of those artists who... How, how can I put this in the kind way that I want to put it? He's outside of drawing and painting. I think he maybe sometimes has some problems with the real world. I think, you know, I'm, a, I'm quite a methodical calculate. That sounds wrong, that sounds negative, but I don't want it to sound like that. But I'm quite at home in the real world and comics is a thing I do. I think with Steve, comics is the world and there's outside is what he has to do. And he, he's, he's a, quite an eccentric character. He's a lovely man. He's a, a passionate, kindly, super talented man who puts much more work into things than he really has to to make, make the paycheck. I mean, I've seen his page designs and his thumbnails and everything he did for the Superman, Batman book, book we did. Um, and again, he made me look so good. He's the master of subtlety. There's a scene in it where, I don't know, Bruce Wayne is hitting on Lois Lane. Yeah. And she's, she's fed up with his attentions. And she does this thing that I didn't even describe in the script where she goes and sort of blows her hair up. So, oh, what's he like? And Steve drew that and it just made the moment perfectly. It gave it a little nuance of character that I had no idea I even wanted there. But the minute I saw it, I thought it's, it's just brilliant. He's also got all the, his artwork flows as, as, as well. It's there's so much going on there. There's so much attention to detail. Yeah. I mean, a true, a true comics genius, definitely. What about Mike Mignola? He's a crusty old curmudgeon, Mike. No, Mike, Mike is a is a is a lovely guy, um, and I did um, uh, um, an aliens book with him. It was a sort of forty eight page story, and we thought that we were going to make a fortune because aliens was really big in those days. We thought, oh, we do this one aliens book will be made for life, it's going to sell so well. But we got there sort of just after the bubble had burst. Oh, it's too and bad. I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm very happy with the story I wrote. I, I don't know how happy Mike was. I think he was okay with it. And then he didn't ink it himself. It was inked by Kevin Nolan, who's a wonderful inker and I thought did a brilliant job. But I think Mike felt it wasn't quite the way he would have done it. And I think he was going through a sort of a period of disaffection with the kind of work he was doing. And he thought, I'm just going to create a character of my own. So he went and created Hellboy. And that was the making of, of Mike. I can't take any credit for that. But I think maybe doing, a, doing Aliens, being given a script and then having it inked by somebody else was maybe one of the things that led him to think, you know, I could do this on my own and enjoy it much more, which is what he, what he did. So, but again... A unique talent and he's had such an influence you see sort of Mignola kind of clones or wannabe yeah. all, all, all over the place and he's got he's got the same understanding of chiaroscuro you know light and shade as somebody like Alex Toth has got he's yeah he's in the absolute top tier for me 
I feel like you could take some credit for Ivan Race, though. Well, I gave him a difficult job to do. I mean, yeah. you know, even to write that brand Thanagar War, which has got literally a cast of thousands, and even to write it and keep it straight in my head was, was uh, you know, really difficult. And he drew all those characters and page after page of crowds of flying people and Thanagarian soldiers and spaceships and planets blowing. I mean, it was just an absolute tour, tour de force. Um, exquisite draftsmanship and yeah again I mean there is that that thing you get what you know as a writer you've done a script and it's just these sort of fairly boring looking pages of typescript and then you get back this fully realized you know gorgeous you know detailed you think my god he must really have loved what I wrote I'm so flattered that he could be bothered to draw all these stuff I stuff that I asked him for so yeah, again, I mean, I I really have been so lucky with the people that I've collaborated with. So yeah. there's an there's an artist that you worked with in the 80s for a very short story that I feel um, doesn't get talked about a lot much anymore. Gray Morrow. Yeah, that was one of those ones that kind of got away again. That was done for um, Christmas. Christmas with the Superheroes. Yeah. which was a DC, a DC kind of seasonal book. And they asked me if I'd like to write a short story for it. And I thought, yeah, what could I do for Christmas? And I thought, oh, particularly in this country, the kind of robin, the red-breasted bird, the, the robin, that's sort of synonymous with Christmas. Maybe I could do a story that featured robin, a, you know, Batman and robin. And then I thought, oh, you know, well, that's me musing and mulling things like that. How could I have a story that featured Robin, but in an interesting way, rather than just make it a Robin story? And I thought, well, Christmas is about, you know, in the Christian myth of bringing light to the world and everything. Maybe it's something to do with that. Maybe there's the darkness that the Robin illuminates. And so maybe we could have a real Robin and maybe we could have a real bat and maybe we could set it in the bat cave. So that was the kind of way I mused about it. And I didn't know who was going to be drawing it when I wrote the story. Uh, and to find out that it was one of the sort of all time greats like Gray Morrow, whose work I'd loved from, again, from the sort of Warren stuff that he did and, 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 and everything. And a guy who's got quite a literal ap approach to drawing, you know, draws things as if they're real, not locked into a superhero kind of style. Um, and he turned in a job that I thought was just just brilliant. He, you know, and it, as I say, it was all set in a cave, and um, it was the the atmosphere of the place was a lot to do with it. And he certainly was really big on atmosphere. So yeah, that again, that was another one. You know, work work with you know uh, wonderful science fiction artist Gray Morrow. Yeah, he'd actually draw the eyes on Batman. Yes, yeah, yeah, and the kind of costume that he gave Batman was a little bit like the Batman in the nineteen forties. Yeah, um, serial, you know, slightly creepy looking, looking Batman. I mean, to me, the best Batman is the Wally Wood uh, Bat Boy, you know. For, for, <laughs> and Rubin, for, for, for I am no, I am no for slugging a normal Bat Boy. I am a vampire <laughs> Bat Boy, you know, with this wonderful picture. He's got these hole punches and he's punching holes in someone's toe and drink drinking their blood out of the straw. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's Batman. That's Batman. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. you've had such a great career and it's been amazing uh so i will just ask you about i know you have an autobiography coming up how good, much how much of the originals is autobiographical right well quite a lot of the originals is, is autobiographical um it, it was funny because a lot of what we've talked about is my collaborations with other people and the originals was the thing that I did completely on myself. I wrote it, drew it, did, 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 designed it, lettered it, blah, 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 the, the, the whole thing. And I actually found that quite a lonely business. I do really enjoy the collaborative aspect of comics, <laughs> even if it's on a transatlantic phone line or with occasional emails. But there's something about being in a team, having somebody to bounce ideas and things off. So I actually found it quite hard going, the originals, because it was like a hundred and don't know, 60 pages. And so you'd be working away for a week and you'd, you and you did a great week's work and you still had, say, 90 pages to do. And it seemed to be this thing that you were never going to get to the end of. There were moments when I'd think, does anybody in the world care about this except me? 
Uh, and I got Vertigo to phone me up. I got one of their editors to phone me up every week on a Friday and say, give me a number, Dave. And, I, and it would be the number of the page that I got to that week. And it would give me at least the feeling that every week somebody cared enough to check in on me and that, that, that I would have to make some progress. Otherwise, I'd be really um, embarrassed. Anyway, uh, it did win an Eisner Award in, in, in the end, I'm very pleased to say. And I'm very pleased to say my wife was in the audience to see me get the award because it had been a hard slog and it, it got a little, I'm, I'm not a grumpy man by nature, but it, it did. I was a little bit worn down by it. So it all turned out all right in the end. But I kind of made a rod for my own back, as they say, because Karen Berger had nagged me for a long time to do a comic that I wrote and drew myself. And I knew that if I was going to be interested enough to do it, it would have to be not just another science fiction thing or, a, you know, a superhero thing. So it was based very much on what I did when I was growing up in the 60s, but it kind of idealised. And as I told you, my autobiography is called Confabulation. It was a confabulated story of what I did when I was growing up. So that's kind of the story on that. So you get in trouble with the cops and everything when you were younger? Yeah, but not quite in the way that it that it is is in that book. Hey, maybe you know what, what we could do? We could we could do this another time, and I could talk to you about the originals a bit more. Then, how does that sound? Absolutely. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will. And of course, I'll... in the meantime, in the meantime, you'll have read my autobiography, and you'll have some of your questions answered anyway. I will. Uh, so I'm going to end this right now with a, with uh, asking you if you have anything to plug coming up this year well i've got a new autobiography coming up no i think it's apart from my autobiography I, I i also recently worked on a on a video game called beyond the steel sky which was originally done for the um, apple platforms but is now available on xbox and it's a really good game based very heavily on my artwork i was the art director for it obviously there were loads of other artists and vis visualizers and 3d modelers work working on it but i'm really really proud of that so if people wanted to check that out they'll they'll get get a bit of the dave gibbons imagination that they can actually play on their xbox and your autobiography is out in october of 2022 it is yeah, called, it's called confabulation it's by dave, dave gibbons with my good friend tim pilcher he's 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 helped me assemble it and it's published by dark horse comics uh, in october and i can't wait for that one Thank you, Thank you very much. Dave Gibbons.